Good morning and welcome to the 26th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items 9, 10 and 11 in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The second item on the agenda um, is to hear evidence on two Scottish statutory instruments, the draft Public Appointments and Public Bodies, etc., Scotland Act 2003, Amendment of Specified Authorities, Order 2017, and the draft Land Reform Scotland Act 2016, Supplemental Provision Regulations 2017. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, Rosanna Cunningham, uh, Andrew Roxton, Solicitor, and Jill Gardner, the Community Assets Action Officer for the Scottish Government. Um, can I uh, ask? Can I ask members if they have any questions for the Cabinet Secretary? Or Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to make any comment at the start? Um, I don't think there's really very much to say <laughs> about either of these, convener. Okay. Do members have any questions on either of these? Okay. This will be nice and easy, I suspect. We just moved to item three. What does Emma want? Emma, uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, thank you, convener. Um, it would be a shame to bring you here to not even ask one question, so I'm interested because we're... <laughs> <laughs> um, one of our... Um, the specification of devolved tax wild fisheries order 2017 is that coming to that? Oh, come to that. All right. Am I jumping the gun? Yes. Okay. It's been an early start for everyone this morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, do any any members have any questions on these? None at all. Okay. So, what do we do? We just go to the. We just move to the motion. So, just go to the next agenda item. So, uh, move to the next agenda item, um, which is consideration of motion S5M07898 that the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the Public Appointments and Public Bodies Scotland Act 2003 Amendment of Specified Authorities Order 2017 draft be approved. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to move that motion? Uh, I wish to move that uh, motion 07897 uh, be agreed. Okay. Do members have any questions at this stage? Okay, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up? <laughs> if necessary? <laughs> I think it's probably not necessary. Okay, so I put the question that motion S5M07898 in the name of Rosanna Cummingham be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The fourth item on our agenda today is consideration of motion S5M07897 that the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016 Supplemental Provision Regulations 2017 be approved. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to speak to and move the motion? Sorry, I thought 897 was the one we just did. No. Does it not? <laughs> 898 was the one we did previously. Oh, did we? Right, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay, um, no, I haven't got anything to add. Okay, thank you. Do members wish to speak on this motion? No. Okay, Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to wind up? No. <laughs> okay, thank you. I put the question on the motion. The question is that the motion S5M07897 in the name of 898, Oh, sorry, eight, nine, six, you're, you're right, eight, you. seven, okay, sorry. S5M07897, in the name of Rosanna Cunningham, be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, thank you. Do you wish to change your officials now? Um, yes. Did I not have to move one of those? No. I don't think I formally moved. Sorry. She didn't move it. She didn't. You did move it. Did I? I've just been told. Right, okay. You want to, to reiterate. <laughs> Do you wish to re re reiterate that you've moved the motion? Um, it's a matter for you, convener. Well, do that and make sure that we've covered this. Well, which one are we on now? Because uh, I'm <laughs> 07897. Thank you. Well, I move that motion 07897 be approved. Right. Um, are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Okay. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Do you want a brief, well, a brief suspension to allow you to change uh, officials?
Welcome back. The fifth item of business on our agenda today is to hear evidence on the Draft Scotland Act 1998, specification of devolved tax, Wild Fisheries Order 2017. Again, we're joined by the Cabinet Secretary for the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, who's accompanied on this occasion by Katie Joshi, Solicitor, and Simon Dryden, Marine Superintendent, Marine Scotland. Uh, can I ask if members have any questions they wish to ask? Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. OK, we're in the right order now. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary and everybody. Um, this is, it is a bit of a tangential question just while you're here, but could the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on when the Wild Fisheries Bill is going to be taken forward? What, what, where are we in the process? Um, there will be... Uh, there is a place for the Wild Fisheries Bill uh, within the lifetime of this Parliament. I don't really want to preempt a future programme for government, um, it was never intended to be a year one bill, um, so uh, it, it isn't at the moment uh, one that's in imminent. Uh, uh, um, and it's, uh, uh, but it's there is a there is a place for it, um, and um, I would have expected it to be potentially round about year three, but I I, I can't preempt programme for government. Okay, and. A lot of the legislative programme is subject to Brexit consequentials as well, which we're carefully looking at. OK, OK. Or members. Yes, John Scott. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, since this bill is about raising tax, at this, even at this early stage, do you have any understanding or knowledge of what level or how the, what the tax rate would be? Well, the bill is not about raising tax. The bill is about reforming fisheries management. This particular order is, uh, is about the transfer of a power yes. to raise a levy, um, but it's not actually about the raising of the levy itself. It simply will allow, in the future, a Scottish government to do so um, if it felt it was appropriate. Um, we've indicated that we do not consider uh, that to be the case. Uh, just now, I, I made it uh, clear earlier this year that I wasn't... Uh, minded to introduce a rod license or uh, other form of uh, of levy, but this is simply the devolution of a power to do so, which will be available to a government in the future should it be feel that that was necessary. Although that's not your intention. It is not my intention. <coughs> um, uh, it, it, it will, uh, you know, the actual uh, raising of a levy will not be in uh, the bill. The bill will allow for a reformed management structure. And it would only be much further down the line if there was a failure in terms of a management, particular area management structure that the government might have to step in. Um, uh, but that is not in our, our minds. Thank you. Any other members wish to ask a question? Okay. Uh, the sixth item on our agenda today is consideration of motion S5M07900 that the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recommends that the Scotland Act 1998 specification of devolved tax wild fisheries order 2017 draft be approved. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to speak and move the motion? Um, I'll move the motion. Thank you. Do any members wish to say anything at this stage? Uh, and members have indicated not. Cabinet Secretary, do we wish to wind up? Um, Indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S5M07900 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, thank you and your officials for your brief attendance this morning. I'm going to suspend uh, to allow you to leave uh, the table.
Um, welcome back to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. The sixth item on our agenda today is consideration of a negative instrument, the Public and Private Water Supplies Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulations 2017, SSI 2017-321. Do any members have any comments to make on this? No comments. Uh, is the committee therefore uh, agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? We are agreed, are we? We are agreed. Okay. We now move to um, agenda item eight, which is our inquiry into air quality in Scotland. Um, we were to be hearing evidence from two panels of stakeholders in relation to the inquiry. Uh, unfortunately, our first evidence session, which was to be by video conference, uh, is not going to proceed owing to technical problems out with our control. Uh, so we will now move to hear evidence from what would have been the second panel of witnesses to explore air quality in Scotland. So can I welcome Graham Applegate, the Principal Policy Officer for Air Quality at the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, Craig McLaren, the Director of, Royal, of the Royal Town Planning Institute Scotland, and Stephen Thompson, Head of Environmental and Sustainability uh, Transport Scotland. I should add that Eric Owens, who was, is the Head of Planning and Sustainable Development at Aberdeen City Council, was to have joined the panel. He too is unavailable today, uh, this time owing to transport difficulties. So, uh, welcome gentlemen. Uh, I, members have a, a series of questions they wish to um, put to you. Um, so, uh, kicking off this morning is um, Mark Roscoe. Mark Roscoe. Thank you, uh, convener, and, and good morning, everybody. Um, we're breaking the law in Scotland. Um, we've got dozens of areas uh, which are breaching EU uh, legal limits for nitrous oxide. Um, what's your thoughts on cleaner air for Scotland as a strategy? Uh, will it bring legal compliance uh, before 2020? Uh, is it fit for purpose, given the High Court ruling uh, on the adequacy of DEFRA and Scottish <coughs> Government plans uh, that was uh, announced earlier on this year. And what do you believe needs to change, if anything, um, in cleaner air for Scotland in order to bring us into legal compliance? Who wishes to kick off? Uh, Graham Apple. I'll kick off, convener. Um, I think uh, clean air for Scotland is fit for purpose. Um, and it, it will assist in bringing us into compliance with the EU legislation. Um, I think it needs to be remembered that CAFS is only well, less than two years old, and as a, a, a national strategy, uh, much of the, the groundwork is currently being put in place to uh, allow us to achieve those legal limits within the shortest possible time, and by 2020. Um, it, it's the case that um, this is the first time Scotland and indeed any of the devolved administrations has taken this approach in relation to air quality. And I think it's, it's, it's the case that um, it, it, the strategy needs to bed in. It needs to be, uh, have time to mature. Um, but um, it's also the case that the existing work that's being carried out under local air quality management is also moving to uh, uh, allow us to achieve legal compliance as well. And I think the two need to be taken together, that we, we already have this existing mechanism in place, um, which uh, should ensure legal compliance, and CAS is complementary, but also supporting to that. Um, so I think it, it is definitely fit for purpose. It, it may be the case that um, in future years it does need to be reviewed to see how progress has has moved on and whether um, parts of the strategy do need to be changed. But um, I would say at the moment, um, CEPRA is fully supportive of CAFs and the work that's being undertaken. And um, we are sort of um, definitely supportive of the strategy in principle and also in implementation. But just before the other um, panelists answer that, as the regulator, do you think we will get legal compliance by 2020 on nitrous oxide or not? It, it appears that we will achieve compliance in three of the non-compliant areas, um, so North East Scotland, Central Scotland, and the Edinburgh agglom agglomeration. Um, Glasgow is currently um, having to go through the process of being remodelled, 
uh, based on some of the road changes that have taken place where potential non-compliances were likely, but the road system has changed. So I think we will uh, be very well on the way to legal compliance by 2020, and we may indeed be fully compliant. Three areas, but what about the rest? Well, it's only Glasgow, okay. the Glasgow agglomeration, which is subject to remodeling. Right. Okay. So it may well be that after the remodeling, it does uh, fall into compliance. Okay. Stephen Thompson. Yeah. The CAFs should be viewed as a live document. The, certainly my, in my own experience, the, the issues of air quality are moving so fast that what was written uh, in good faith, uh, as Graham says, towards the tail end of, of, of I think it was 2015, uh, could be, could be used as a, or looked at as an update. So, for example, what's in programme for government just now for low emission zones uh, is not explicitly stated in CAFs. So I think it's fair that if we had a, a review of, CA, of CAFs, it would be picking up the elements that have already been published in the likes of, of PFG. And it's, yeah, to, to look at it as a live document uh, to find out what, for example, comes out of this inquiry uh, and comes out of parliamentary statements so that they are captured within uh, the, the, the updates to CAFs. But I would agree with Graham that it, as a strategy, it's, it's on the right path. Craig McConnell. Yeah, uh, we were uh, part of the, the reference group which took forward uh, the, the CAFs document. Um, so um, I think that shows, goes to show that we actually had quite a, uh, quite a lot of faith in it. We think it's a good document. I think it's, um, uh, hopefully it will get us towards compliance. I think one of the things we need to be reminded from, from a planning perspective, uh, certainly, is that many of the actions in it are going to be um, more fruitful in the medium to longer term as well. So there are some short term actions in there, obviously. But from a planning perspective, changing your built environment around isn't going to happen overnight. Um, and there are things we have to we have to bear that in mind as we take that forward. So, but I think the other good thing about um, about CAFs for me is that it's something which is looking to across a different range of disciplines, professions, organisations to do stuff. So it's acting as that coordinator, which is which is useful. I think good. Um, and I'm particularly struck. I like the, the diagram on page 11, which talks about the idea about uh, how we need to focus on placemaking and transport. So it's not just the, 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 the immediate and the initial, initial sort of actions have to be taken. It's taking a, a, a longer viewpoint in this and actually trying to create places where people want to live, people want to work, people want to have their leisure time, which allows um, a, a much more healthy environment for them as well. And we need to keep an eye on that longer term aspiration as well as the shorter term gains. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the, the actions that are in, in CAFs, I mean, you, you know, you've commented on the approach that CAFs takes. Um, <laughs> as being an exemplar, but in terms of the actions, how confident are you that all of these actions can be delivered, particularly given that, you know, we've got issues with the capacity of local authorities and many stakeholders that CAFS is reliant on to actually get to the point where we can confidently say, we're legal, people are going to stop dying. From our perspective, I think that a number of actions have already happened, to be honest with you. We, we've worked to do uh, to undertake guidance for planners um, to make sure that they're aware of the issues in terms of air quality. And we published that uh, last year, in January last year, with Environmental Protection Scotland. We're trying to roll out our, uh, an awareness raising programme for planners to make sure that they're in it as well. I think there are also opportunities which we can grasp. Um, as, as Stephen said, it, this is a bit of a sort of moving feast. So there are opportunities, I think, which we can take forward, and um, things such as uh, the new national planning framework when it's looked at in 2020, the Scottish planning policy. Um, I think they can be a bit stronger on air quality. Just now, they tend to give it a nod rather than actually say anything totally specific about air quality and the role of planning, so there are opportunities there. And certainly, there's, as, as the committee will know, there's a review of the planning system on just now. Um, a planning bill should be with you at the end of, the, end of this year. So again, there are opportunities to look at from a planning perspective where it can actually uh, um, come, up to, uh, come up to speed and, and make the mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in terms of the, the challenges, the, the challenge of resource is maybe twofold. Uh, the, there's a real challenge of, of resource just within the, the organisations that you see here. Um, but there's also a challenge, it's a positive challenge, to bring different professions together. Uh, those, those professions that might move at different speeds uh, have different uh, ambitions or visions. So, for example, the uh, engaging with the, the, the freight sector or the bus sector uh, to make sure that as, uh, as government, we're, we're listening to what those uh, sectors are, are saying. So there's a, there's a challenge, but it's a, I think it's a positive challenge to bring all those different professions together uh, on the same page at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just reiterate what Stephen said there, um, that, you know, 
CAFS brings together a wide range of partner organisations all operating within uh, various uh, individual uh, constraints. But I think the, the amount of work that's been done uh, since CAF was initiated in 2015 has, has, has been um, very, very good. And we have actually maximised the resources that each organisation has brought to the table. So there will always be constraints upon each of the organisations and probably on CAFs as a whole, um, because that's just a, a practical reality of life. But I think we, we definitely have brought together the right people around the table and um, utilised the resources as best we can at this time. Can I come in again? Just, just to follow that up, I think one of the things about CAFs, which has been incredibly useful, is it's, um, it's given us something to gather around and to take together as different professions and different organisations. Um, I'm not sure we would have all worked together much more closely if we didn't have CAFs there and we didn't have the, the, the work done in the lead-up to CAFs as well. And I think that's given us all, certainly from a planning perspective, it's given us a better understanding of the issues which we face um, and how the role that we can play, but also the role that others can play and what we can and cannot do and how we should all be trying to complement one another. Do you think there's enough focus in CAFs on active travel? There is a focus on active travel just now uh, based on what we knew towards the tail end of 2015. And I think that's where this issue of uh, CAF's perhaps been a live document. Uh, I think things have moved on quite substantially on active travel. Uh, so th there's always scope for widening the, the elements, uh, for example, of, of active travel in, in a document like CAF's. Uh, I, th I think very recently the, the promotion of, of the budget towards active travel has has shown where Minister's ambitions are going. Uh, CAFs is, is, was produced at a, a point in time uh, when we knew what we knew on, on active travel was included in CAFs. So that's where maybe the, the, the viewing of the document as a live document could bring what we know now towards the tail end of 2017 uh, into, uh, into fruition. It's, excuse me, it's not to say, though, that the, the actions in CAFs are the, the actions that we are delivering now Actually, the policies that we're delivering on active travel now are the policies that we're delivering. So CAFs has to uh, follow that rather than the other way around. Uh, active travel is in there, um, which is good. Uh, and as I said earlier on, I, I like the fact that CAFs talks about the, 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 um, the role of the built environment um, and active travel is a, a key component of that. I, in another role, chair the National Walking Strategy Delivery Forum. So I'm always keen to see more in active travel. So I, I would like to see more in it, and I'd like to see a greater recognition, although it's in there, of the role that active travel can play. Um, as, uh, as Stephen's already said, I think the doubling of the budget for active travel is a step in the right direction, uh, absolutely. But we need to make sure that it's used in the right way and it has the maximum impact. Yeah, I think just finishing off on that, I think there was, was it a Cycling Scotland conference was yesterday. Yeah. Uh, so we were talking about the, the role that active travel can play in terms of improving air quality. Uh, at, at that conference as well. So I think, uh, as Craig says, that's what CAFS has done, is to bring a number of, of professions and organisations together to, to talk on uh, a common theme. Uh, and no one that I've talked to uh, since CAFS was put together has said that challenging air pollution is a bad idea. So, so just finally, convener, I mean, if Programme for Government has kind of overtaken CAFS, and if the Supreme Court is saying that plans need to be updated at UK and Scottish Government level, What's your commitment in Transport Scotland then to update CAFs? Because it seems that there's a logical updating, an urgent updating that's required from everything that I've heard from you this morning. So CAFs itself is, is overseen by a, a governance group, uh, which is co-chaired by Scottish Government, SEPA uh, and Transport Scotland. Uh, it meets every six weeks uh, or so. And within that governance group, there is the, there is the potential to uh, review where CAFs uh, sits at this point in time. Uh, it's not been uh, on the agenda so far because we, we, we feel that it is in a, a place that it's allowing actions to be achieved. But if uh, following the, the lights of the, the inquiry today, that, that is viewed as a, a place where we, we need to uh, go back and, and review uh, CAFs, and that, that can be done. Uh, personally, I think it is in a, a fit for purpose state just now. Uh, but there is always scope to do that. Just add one other thing. The CAFs is actually reviewed on an annual basis and an annual progress report is produced. So it may well be that the things that have happened in the last year are taken account of in that report and that then provides a springboard for looking at inclusion 
in, in future years. Can you, can you just confirm annually when? Uh, annually, I think last, or this, this current year for the previous year, it was produced in June. In the last couple of months. Yeah. yeah. So I think it was, um, it w was around June, July time, yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. publicly available on the Scottish Government website as well. OK, thank you. John Scott. Um, thank you, Convener. And I just wanted, in terms of spatial planning, and much of the CAVS document and other evidence suggests that an emphasis on modal shift. Um, and, and, of course, I'm a supporter of that, but it, the document, and I appreciate this is very much an urban um, problem, but the document doesn't make much a take much account of rurality and peripherality and the difficulty of, of a modal shift in terms of the general air quality across uh, the whole of Scotland rather than in particular difficult urban black spots. Um, so would you care to comment on that in terms of <coughs> spatial planning and, and thinking about that? Modal shift really? It, um I think you're right insofar as modal shifts is something which is easier to do in urban areas just because of the, well, the circumstances which are there. That doesn't mean we should, we should not try to do it in rural areas as well. Um, I think um, it's, um, it relies a lot on trying to make sure we can link the, the, the uh, public transport better. Um, we can also look at how we can better locate some of the new developments which we have in place as well. So um, the, the idea of a sustainable development or a sustainable place is that actually it doesn't add to people having to use their cars to travel, to get to work or to get to the shops. So we should be looking at ways in which we can, we can make sure that happens through making sure that new developments are linked to public transport services, um, uh, it ideally trains, but buses as well, if that's possible. We should also be looking to see if we can build at a scale where the services which you require in a particular area um, uh, can, um, th there's a sort of viability there for those services to be able to be located as well. You'll have a local shop, a chemist, a doctor's surgery or whatever as well. So that in itself isn't always easy um, because um, not all the developments which, you're, which uh, applicants put in are going to be of that scale. So there's a job to be done to try and make sure you can build that up and think about how it works cumulatively as well. Uh, uh, excellent, thank you. It's just really to make certain that that's part of the thinking as well, the, the kind of different approach almost to, to planning in that regard. It's there, it's probably not as strongly articulated as it perhaps could be. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's move this on, Donald Cameron. <laughs> thank you, and morning to the, the panel. Um, last week, the committee was in Kostofen, uh, where there is a, a well-known problem uh, uh, relating to air quality. Um, there are also housing pressures and a need for more housing in that area. Um, there are much-loved green spaces around Kostorfin. There is, of course, the airport, um, and there is a number of uh, transport interchanges, road, rail, tram, etc. How, uh, as planners, can you ensure that these sort of multiple diverse pressures uh, of development when you're developing are, are adequately balanced against each other? Uh, with difficulty, um, no. Um, I think one of the, one of the things I would like to see um, is I move away from thinking about planning as just processing planning applications. Uh, that's an important part of what planners do, um, but what it tends to be is, is rather reactive. Um, what we should be trying to do, and this is something we're trying to promote through the review of the planning system, is a much more front-loaded approach where you get your stakeholders, your communities, um, all the people who are responsible for, um, for that area or have got an interest in that area, to come together to look at what the opportunities for that area are, uh, to look at what the constraints are for that area, and to try and come up with a vision for that area. And then from there, work out how you're going to deliver that vision uh, through some form of route map. And that means saying to people, you have responsibility for doing this, you've got resources to put in here. Um, and what that does is that gives you a much more holistic and rounded view of how that community will, uh, will work over time. And that development plan, uh, or that master plan, or whatever it is for that area, would provide the context for processing planning applications. So you would have a, a more rounded approach taken um, to um, the development of that area, and the planning application would just be a part of that, rather than actually being the key part, the, the sort of the main part of that. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that because you know, in Kostofen, for example, when people hear of a new planning development, they re immediately think, and they were telling us this last week, they immediately think this is going to add to the problem. Um, and their hackles are raised at once, um, and, and, and they need reassurance. Um, so are you, do you have anything to add to that? Do you have any of the other 
panel members want to add to that? How do we, st how do, how do we nip that in the bud and reassure people? I think um, we now have to um, encourage people to, to believe that the planning system can be the solution to a lot of the problems. And it's, a, it's selling the message, but also making it a convincing message that, um, you know, that the, the previous potential um, planning errors or, you know, uh, the things that didn't add up in the past won't be repeated in the future, but actually the planning system will work beneficially for communities and populations. And if they embrace the process and become involved with that, then, you know, they, they can help steer and educate the planners at the same time. So it's, a, it's really a, a two-way process of communication and also full engagement with the local communities. Is it, Claudia Beamish has a quick question. Good morning to the panel. And it's just to ask you if any of you have any um, thoughts on what has proved, in my view, a very challenging issue, which is the involvement of communities that don't necessarily um, get involved in these issues, either because they're too busy or they're on low incomes and challenged in that way. And uh, how, how can these processes uh, for planning be more inclusive? Because it is quite alarming um, when you look at who, who does engage and who doesn't. And that's not a criticism of yourselves. It's just, if you've got any thoughts, it'd be valuable. Uh, question. In the context of new developments, to what extent can incorporating green infrastructure mitigate their impacts? And how well cited are uh, those who are in charge of these developments on that as an option? Can I answer, uh, answer that one first, if okay. that's okay? Yeah. Um, I think green infrastructure is becoming much more a, a, a mainstream part of the way in which development is happening. Um, I think uh, planners and local authorities um, are generally there to try and promote that as often as they possibly can through their development plan and through uh, the assessment of planning applications. Um, I think developers are starting to look at it as well when they're putting their application in. I think probably more work could be done on that, to be honest with you. But I think we are seeing more and more um, sort of SUD schemes, for example, coming in. But there's a bit of work to try and make sure that the original applications that come in think about this as a mainstream part of what they do. Uh, so, so I think we are, we're along the road with that. Uh, it's starting to become uh, um, quite important. In terms of the, the issue around communities, um, it is incredibly hard to engage with communities. Um, uh, but it's important that we do. Uh, community engagement has been a part of the planning system since 1969. I, I think over the last maybe decade or so, um, planners have um, have moved away from the old traditional um, approaches where we used to organise a meeting in a drafty church hall on a Wednesday night when the football was on and nobody turned up. I think there's much more creative approaches being taken towards engagement now, uh, social media, um, the growth of the charrettes. Um, there's been a number of charrettes organised and funded by Scottish Government which I think are a really, really useful way of trying to get people to talk about what they want for the community at the start of the process, rather than what they don't want for the community at the end of the process. Um, so there's, I think they, they're useful, and I think they have tried, as, as far as I can see, to engage those who aren't engaged, because um, they're, they're over, generally over a number of days, and you don't have to be there for all three or four days, so it allows people to drop in and drop out of that as well. I think there is still much work to be done in getting to some of the, uh, the harder to reach groups, absolutely. Um, but I think um, as a profession, um, we're looking to see how we, we can do that. Um, I suppose as part of that process, we do support organisations such as, as PAS, Planning Aid Scotland, who work with communities and they're doing more and more work with harder to reach communities. And I think it's, it's to maybe show the, um, the depth of commitment to community engagement across the profession. About 20% of uh, RTPI Scotland's members volunteer for Planning Aid for Scotland, which is a phenomenal amount for, uh, for any profession. So the, the, I think that the will is certainly there, um, but there are logistical issues which we're still trying to overcome, but we're, we're getting there bit by bit, and we're trying to become more creative uh, as we take that forward. And mm -hmm. Was there another question? Mm -hmm. I think we put it on to Mr Cameron's question. I just want to ask another uh, different question, actually, which is um, to talk about policy integration. Um, we, we, there are obviously a, a, a number of layers of governments that are involved in this. There's local government, there's the Scottish government, there's the UK government, and there's the EU um, structure around that. Um, what are your observations on, on that integration? Is it working? And... How do you deal with a situation where, for example, one local authority may take um, one approach that is different from its neighbouring local authority? Or, for instance, we have a different approach in Dumfries 
than there might be in Carlisle, these kind of transboundary issues. How do we deal with those appropriately? <laughs> I'll answer that one first. Um, I think the policy integration is, is, is getting much better than it was. Um, because air quality has effectively devolved to the Scottish Parliament, um, we have been able to um, sort of forge out, take our own path and um, are considerably ahead of some other parts of the UK in what we're doing, what we're proposing, and indeed the, the, the pollution levels. Um, as the legislation has pretty much all fallen from the EU and been fully implemented um, across the UK. Um, we, we've had the UK air quality strategy in place since 1997, which has now been updated twice since um, the last version in 2007. So the, the, the broad policy framework is there in the background. Um, Scotland has decided to actually move ahead and be more proactive in relation to implementing air quality measures and also um, stricter limits, for example, for particulate matter. Um, so I think, I think it is effective and um, we, we, because we have that individuality, we have been able to do what we want. Um, can you repeat the second, the second question? It, it's just how do you, in practice, deal with a situation where Local you know, Glasgow City Council takes a different attitude to low emission zones than it's you know, North Lanarkshire, for example, or whatever it might be. I well, mean, that, that sort of pr problem. Yeah, sure. That's one of the main aims of CAFs, is to ensure consistency across the whole of Scotland. So uh, initially, in relation to the low emission zones, where the, the four largest cities have um, expressed the interest to implement, um, the CAFs process will oversee that on a consistent basis. So we have a, a national modelling framework which, although provides individual results for each of the cities, is done on a cons consistent basis. So uh, the results are effectively comparable. In relation to the, for example, non-low emission zone local authorities, so the more rural ones, certainly SEPA and the local authorities are in constant dialogue. So there are various uh, liaison groups where best practice can be shared, uh, the, the fundamentals of CAFs can be um, brought to the table, and it's, it's through the local air quality management process that the process is very, it's, it's recently been streamlined to ensure that people report in the same way, that the, the data is presented in the same way. And, SEPA certainly sees all of the reports from each of the local authorities. So where there may be inconsistencies, we can comment back to the local authorities on uh, trying to align them more with, say, for example, best practice in a, in a local authority. It is challenging with 32 separate authorities, but I think we do have a process in place which does ensure a wide uh, level of consistency, and many of the solutions for air quality problems are common. Um, that there, there, there isn't anything uh, wild or wacky out there. It, it, people know the solutions, they know where they need to be implemented, and in most cases, local authorities are, are doing that. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's a good question uh, in terms of the relationships between the different levels of government. Uh, so if I can take it the next tier down from what Graham's mentioned in terms of CAFs, we're in the process now of delivering the, the low emission zone delivery groups on, on the ground. So we've been quite clear to state that we want that to be a partnership between uh, central government and, and local government. So the LEZ delivery groups are set up so that it has members from both levels of government on it. Uh, within the LEZ delivery group for Glasgow that's been set up, you then have a suite of professions that are bringing uh, their expertise into the room. So uh, it's not just relying on uh, environmental professionals, there's transport, uh, planning, legal, uh, procurement, uh, equalities. Uh, and that's happening right now. So it's t just to give you confidence that that level of uh, engagement uh, between national government and local government is happening. And then if you flip it around the other way, we're in contact with the Joint Air Quality Unit within the UK government uh, so that we're at least cited on the, the paths that they're taking on what might seem like minor topics like signage for low emission zones. You could have the best low emission zone in the entire universe but if you don't have signs for it to get in, no one knows what they're, what they're entering. And those, those signs have to be consistent if you're travelling, for example, from London to Manchester to Edinburgh. So we're making sure that we're working across uh, the national governments as well for, for consistency. And that, that has to be the key in all, all of this. 
Can I just bring in a planning perspective? Mm -hmm. on this, um, mm -hmm. in, in planning, we've got a, a very useful planning hierarchy. Uh, obviously, planning is devolved uh, totally to the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government. Um, the planning hierarchy allows us to look at um, what happens at a national level through uh, Scottish Government, through the National Planning Framework and Scottish Planning Policy and, and another suite of documents. We then have at a regional level in the four city regions, we have um, strategic development plans and strategic, strategic development plan authorities. And they're a useful way of working across some of those more urban areas to look at what the issues are and to get agreement on a, a strategic development plan, how we take that forward. Uh, and then at the local area, we have our local development plan, so that there's a cl quite a clear hi hierarchy. I think one of the things to, to mention, however, is um, the current review of the planning system is looking to, I think the term it's used is repurpose the strategic development plan authorities and strategic development plan plans themselves. The idea behind that, I think, is to try and create a lot, uh, a lot better horizontal integration amongst sort of planning, transport, infrastructure regional city deals uh, uh, and things like that, which I think could be, be could be useful. But I think we still have to keep something at that level, which gives us that strategic overview um, of those city region areas, because that's where I think we could most bang for our buck. Are you finished, Mr Cameron? Yeah. Okay, moving on. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Yes, uh, convener, good morning to, to the panel members. Um, we, we know that uh, there are 34 distinct actions to be carried out by 2020 in relation to Section 14 uh, of, of CAFs. Now, um, we've perhaps touched on this during Mark Ruskell's questioning, but can you tell the committee uh, what work each of your rep rep respective bodies are carrying out to ensure that the actions set out in Section 14 of CAFs are being implemented? Or uh, to, to start off with, so from the transport perspective, my view, I think there's, there's three components to, uh, to CAFs. Uh, the, the first uh, is linked to the existing actions across the likes of, of active travel, uh, low emission vehicles and such like, and that's been taken forward by a, uh, a suite of officials within Transport Scotland. Uh, the second group is linked specifically to the work under the, the National Low Emission Framework and development of low emission zones. Uh, that's my, myself particularly that is leading on that work. And then there's a third uh, set of actions or relatively small set of actions round about air quality management areas that are so associated with the trunk load network. So the, the last one on that element is, is focusing particularly on, I think it's the A75 in Creef. So we're, we're working with Perth and Ross Council just now on their air quality action plan uh, and, and reviewing that as it's, it's about to go to committee. From, a, from an RTBI perspective, um, we were, um, as part of the, the advisory group, um, the reference group, uh, we were charged with trying to improve the understanding of air quality amongst planners and to try and make sure there was a link between planning and other professions. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier on, one of the key things about that was to publish some guidance for, for planners, which we did with Environmental Protection Scotland uh, last year. We held a conference as well, trying to bring together um, the sort of uh, air quality people with the planners to try and break down some barriers to allow people to get different perspectives and to get an idea of who did what and what, what their constraints and the opportunities were to do that as well. So we've done that. We've also had been working in the past with SEPA looking at training. That's not quite worked out where we wanted it to be as yet. I think there's still a bit of work to do on that because we want to make sure it's not just seen as, uh, as planners sitting in isolation, which are portrayed, but how planners work with others across local authorities and, uh, and community planning partnerships as well. So there's, there's probably a bit of work to be done on that. Um, and we've also tried to publicise that amongst the profession through using our journal, the Scottish Planner. We've had an article in that uh, on, the, on the guidance. And just generally tried to tie it in much more to the way in which we work as a profession. Um, so I think there's been some, uh, some movement made on that. Um, the other thing I think which we've got a role to do is to um, make sure that the review of the National Planning Framework and the review of Scottish Planning Policy, which were originally <coughs> going to be in 2019 and been pushed back to 2020, we need to make sure that air quality is seen as a key component of that. Um, just now there are references uh, to air pollution in both, but there's not, they, were, they were both published pre-CAFs. So there's a need to try and make sure that CAFs is um, is mainstreamed into it, um, into those documents as well. So we will be working to do that as, as far as we can. Uh, from CEPA's perspective, uh, we have been um, charged with delivery of the national modelling framework. So this is providing the evidence base for the, the four cities which are currently uh, 
looking at implementing a low emission zone. So there's been a lot of um, construction of scientific models, input of data, and also analysis of outputs, which are now feeding into the LEZ um, proposals for, for each of the potential cities. Um, we've been assisting Scottish Government in the development of guidance and policy. So this is, has included the revision of the local air quality management system, um, revised uh, policy guidance for local authorities. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, through the local air quality management system, we've also been helping local authorities implement the potential uh, aspects of CAFs which are appropriate to them, and so viewing their reports, seeing what where CAFs is linked in, and also um, informing them of where uh, further benefits or gains can be achieved. Um, the training package, which Craig mentioned, uh, with CEPA is still leading and working on at the moment, and that's aimed to be delivered by the end of this calendar year, uh, ready for rollout in 2018. And primarily, uh, as well, uh, being a member of the CAFS governance group, um, we're charged with assisting Scottish Government in overall delivery of uh, the CAF's objectives as well. So where, where we may not necessarily have regulatory responsibility, we're still assisting the Scottish Government in delivery of CAF's. Okay, thanks. And would you say that all these actions are being, del del being de delivered on time and within budget, or are there any barriers that, are you're, that you're hitting <coughs> uh, in the implementation? We, we, we didn't have a budget for it, to be honest with you, so we've just done it. Um, um, I've just, it's been staff time more than anything else, the, most stuff we've done. Um, as I said, I, I think we've started something. I think CAFS has acted as that sort of focus, which has um, got certainly from the planning profession's perspective, is, is focused the mind a bit. Um, and I think what we'll, what I'm keen to see is in the new iteration, <coughs> excuse me, the new iteration of development plans, we'll probably see much more emphasis on the role that planning can play in terms of air quality. I think it's important to say that planning is not the silver bullet in this, and it's not going to give all the immediate um, the immediate um, impact. But planning has a role to play, and I think we can see that. I, I think in looking at and scanning some development plans yesterday from across different parts of Scotland, I think. Um, Air quality is something which planners have in their mind, but they might not necessarily cite it specifically within a policy. There are some policies in development plans that talk about air quality as such, but development plans will talk about the quality of public places, talk about place making, and they'll talk about reducing car travel, um, uh, whether, that's whether that's unnecessary as well. So it's, it's, um, it's not, I say it's specifically mentioned, but the idea of trying to improve air quality is something which is part of what they're trying to do. Cross call, do you want to come in here? Um, yeah, thanks, Kavir. I mean, specifically on um, local development plans, I mean, the, the, the process behind the, the production of an LDP is pretty robust and involves different stakeholders. It goes to Scottish Government examination process at the end of that. But have there been any examples where SEPA or Transport Scotland have stepped in with a local development plan and said, hang on a minute, this major housing allocation or this transport development in this place is going to worsen air quality, therefore you have to remove that from your local development plan. Aware of any um, from a transport perspective. It's not to say that we haven't done that, but I'm not aware of that. I haven't seen anything um, as statutory consultees um, there's a role um, to comment on planning applications and they will have a role in terms of, de of uh, processing the development plan itself. So as I said earlier, I, I would like to think there's probably a, um, more value in trying to have that upfront policy in place through the development plan. So I think there's a role for Transport Scotland, SEPA and other organisations to engage at the start of these processes so we get the policies right, which present the framework for the planning applications when they're assessed. Um, uh, it's not something I'm aware of, but it's certainly something I can check and get back to the committee on um, to ensure we'll see whether SEPA has commented. I think that would be useful. I mean, there was an example with Perth and Kinross where a major housing allocation for 800 houses uh, was objected to by the Director of Public Health at NHS Tayside because of potential impact on their quality management area. However, it still sits there in the local development plan was approved. So I'm kind of curious as to you know, we, we sort of talk about good practice, but what is the role of the regulator in Transport Scotland then in, in making a decision or going over the head of local authorities if there is a serious impact which could be demonstrated at a national level? Okay, so you'll come back to us on that in due course. Okay, thanks. Angus MacDonald, do you want to continue? Yeah, um, just kind of following on from that uh, and, and directing this at, at Craig McLaren, our, our 
planners are able to effectively evaluate the, the, the cumulative impacts of emissions and develop spatial plans that uh, reduce human exposure? I think, um, like myself as a planner, um, the science of air quality is not something which all planners will know about. Um, uh, and I don't think, to be honest with you, it's something they need to know about. Um, I think what they have to do is they have to take advice from colleagues who deal with air quality uh, and see what the impacts are. The, uh, the guidance which we published was very much awareness raising, and it did talk, it did talk them through the planning, particularly for a planning, processing a planning application, the process and what they should be doing at certain times and who they should be talking to and what things they should be thinking about around uh, doing that process. So that's raised the awareness, but they will not know the, the science and the, the mathematics behind it all, to be frank with you, because it's very specialised, it's quite specialised art and science. So I think one of the things we tried to do with that guidance when we launched it was bring together planners with those responsible for air quality and local authorities to try and almost break down those barriers and bring people together so they could, uh, they could work out whose role was to do what on that. But you'd agree that the, the, the cumulative impact is becoming more and more of an issue? Community impact? C commu cumulative, uh, cumulative impact. Cumulative is, impact. Uh, yeah, absolutely. C cumulative impact was one of the things which was mentioned in the guidance. And, and I suppose in many ways uh, that's one of the key mindsets that planners have because um, we are trained to think not just be, well, look to train beyond, think beyond the, uh, the here and now and the immediate geography an area of an area. It's about thinking about how things add up and what impact they have over a period of time and also within that broader geography. So, yeah, planners are well suited to do that and to think that through, but I think they need to work with air quality colleagues as well. Yeah, thanks. This point about airports, because it strikes me that airports are, are very much magnets for vehicles, whether they be cars, buses, um, freight. They attract a great many vehicles in the course of a day. Very often they are surrounded by housing, but with little green infrastructure by necessity. Um, to what extent are airports a concern around air quality and pollution? I don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you. But the one thing I would say is um, we're trying to make sure that airports or any major um, hubs which attract people are served better by public transport and we minimise the need for people to actually travel by car to them as well. And you've seen that happening, I think, at airports across Scotland where there's been uh, initiatives which have tried to provide people with the facilities and the, and, and the services to get to airports. The Edinburgh Trams Network is an example of that. But you've also seen um, places like uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh introducing fees for uh, parking um, and drop down, uh, uh, dropping people down as well. I think they're part of the, uh, the whole idea of trying to encourage people to use public transport to get to uh, to, to airports. Oh, but if you think of the number of um, air parks that there are uh, around the airports, because people are obviously flying off on holiday, there is an encouragement to bring your vehicle to the airports. And I'm just wondering, is there any statistical information out there about the extent to which airports are a problem in this regard? I, I, can, I can take a guess at it, uh, in that, the, to my knowledge, there's no airports within air quality management areas. I, I might be wrong on that, but... It, Certainly in the, the evidence that we've looked at for air quality management areas, airports have not been part of the, the, the main dialogue. I think part of that is, you know, by their very nature, they tend to be in open spaces. So the air quality management challenges that we have in Scotland have a tendency to be in uh, urban spaces where there's street canyons and the, the, the poor air quality doesn't have any, anywhere to go. By the very nature of airports, they are the, actually the opposite. So uh, I'd, I'd take a a good guess that air quality management areas do not have airports uh, within them for that reason. Yeah, I would agree. It's the, the main problem is access to and from the airport and the vol volume of traffic. Uh, for the purposes of local air quality management, an airport wouldn't be included in um, an air quality management area because it doesn't meet the criteria. Um, but you, you wouldn't have uh, human receptors within the actual, you know, the grounds of the airport just the terminal building. Um, so certainly access is, is a big issue. And uh, it, it's the case that I think the, the, the air parks themselves, it, I don't think it's really been quantified, but there are significant amounts of traffic going to the edges of airports, which uh, may well need some investigation in the future. I'm getting at, should this be looked at? It, it possibly should be looked at, but... Um, who would look at it? I mean, the local authority have to look at the, the access roads 
within their local authority area as part of the air quality management process. Um, but if a, a problem is not identified as uh, existing, then obviously an air quality management area isn't required. So it may well be that the volume of traffic um, for Scottish airports is not of the same magnitude as some of the larger ones, and therefore an air quality problem doesn't currently exist, but that doesn't mean that it may not exist in the future at some point if, if traffic were to increase. John Scott. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, just going back to uh, Stephen Thompson's point, and one of the things that struck us, or struck me at any rate, in our visit to Christorfen and the intersection at St John's Road, where you have that monitor, was the architecture of the buildings uh, around that area and the fact that unless the wind was blowing along the corridor, the, the Glasgow to Edinburgh corridor, the Christorfen Road corridor, then that's where you have a problem. So will climate change, as predicted, um, mitigate, um, given the, uh, the, these effects, given that we're expecting more wind and, and rain and, and less high-pressure systems, shall we say, o over Scotland? Um, but also, in terms of the architecture, in terms of a planning question, presumably you no longer would want to have high-rise buildings around um, intersections such as those, which essentially are trap the air um, in, in those areas uh, rather than allow it to disperse as we've just discussed around the airports. W would that be a feature of future planning considerations? I'll take the first part. Uh, it's, it's a fair point in terms of the, the impacts on air quality are somewhat determined by the local meteorology. So if you have the wind blowing in a particular direction, you know, along a street canyon, then it will clean out the, the, the air quality. But if that, if that wind moves, say, at 90 degrees, uh, it's going to actually create a vortex which does the opposite uh, and will hold the air pollution in. Uh, so I'm not saying that we, we're solely reliant on the meteorology to solve our air quality challenges. That's absolutely not where we want to be. Uh, but the meteorology will play a part, and that's why you'll see uh, perhaps trends uh, on a 24-hour, a weekly, or even a yearly basis, depending on what meteorology is within Scotland. Even if we did absolutely nothing, the meteorology might have a proportion or contribution to, to either improving or uh, decreasing the, the air quality uh, as well. The, the street canyoning effects, I think, uh, were probably a, a, an issue which weren't particularly well known amongst planners until uh, recently. So the guidance I've mentioned, which we published with Environmental Protection Scotland, raises that um, for planners to consider as part of their assessment of planning applications and if they're, if they're putting forward development plan policies on it as well. So I think it's something which is the awareness of it's been raised. Um, I'll wait to see as to how that will actually be implemented. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think on, on top of that, the, the, this technology that's been tested right now uh, in terms of uh, materials that can be yeah. added to buildings or added to infrastructure that can attract pollution uh, and essentially make the pollution stick to, uh, to the, uh, the infrastructure. The, the biggest challenge, we believe, uh, is that it depends on, the, again, it's linked back to meteorology, is how much time the pollution has and able to adhere to the, uh, to the material. So the theory in the labs is that the, this material uh, will, will stick to, or the pollution will stick to the, the, the adhesive materials. In reality, with meteorology moving, the pollution around, it, it literally doesn't have enough time uh, to, to, to adhere to, to infrastructure. Just developing that thought then, are there materials therefore to be avoided in terms of um, cladding of buildings uh, close to areas where air pollution might be a problem in terms of reducing that problem in the design of buildings. I, I, Is that I, what I, you're I, saying? I, I, I don't know the, the answer to that, to be honest with you. But just to back up what Stephen said, I think one of the things which it's our guidance talks about is, is green spaces and, and trying to bring more vegetation in, for example, as well, because that can help. Um, that's a stickiness uh, as well. So I think that's something which will continue and I think which planners will try and encourage as much as possible new developments. Yeah, I, I know the, it's, it's maybe again in two parts. I know Highways England are looking at the, the technology I've just talked about in terms of the, 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 the materials that can be put onto to noise barriers uh, so that there's a, a mix of noise and, and air quality. Uh, I know the work that I've been doing for the World Road Association, that that type of technology is also looked at in Korea. So it's, it's, there are examples uh, I think there's also examples in, in Europe about the use of vegetation to, to act as a, a, an absorbent for, for air pollution. So it goes, maybe goes back to some of the question several 
uh, minutes ago about uh, green infrastructure and the role that it can play. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks, MacDonald. Um, if I could uh, nip quickly back to uh, active travel um, and ask specifically um, if you if you reckon the cycling action plan and the national walking strategy are adequate uh, and is progress being made towards a target of 10% of all journeys by uh, 2020 being made by bike? I'd, from, from speaking to colleagues in Transport Scotland, they, they seem confident that that is the, the target that they're going to go towards. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of the, the updates to the, the cycle action plan or the national walking strategy, so by, by, by that I take from, from colleagues that they, these plans are sufficient for where they, they want those plans to go to uh, in, in the short to medium term. Carson. Um, how do sources of air pollution out, within, out with the control of local authorities, uh, how, how is it effectively controlled? Uh, so for areas such as trunk roads or, or, or areas that are controlled specifically under, under SEPA, you, know, you mentioned the A75 as an area. Um, how, how do you actually control it and monitor it and, and therefore police it? Well, the monitoring element, we will rely on the, the national uh, network of sensors that are set up that Scottish Government uh, provide to local authorities uh, to, uh, to monitor. Uh, we would rely on those, those sensors on the, the A75 because they, they, they essentially run through Creef uh, and those monitors are, are, are fit for purpose. Uh, the, in terms of the, the actual mitigation on uh, a scheme like that, we've been involved in the development of or the, the co-development of the, the air quality uh, action plan by Perth Inc and Ross Council uh, fr from its outset. So we, we've, we've made uh, several mentions of what ca could potentially or could potentially not be done uh, in a, sp a space like Creef, uh, which is uh, by its nature quite a traditional setup of uh, high street, uh, relatively high, uh, three, four storey high buildings in a, in a tight street canyon effect where the, sh the traffic doesn't really have anywhere to go. So we've been involved in the, the development of the air quality plans uh, from the outset. Um, and in terms of the, the monitoring on the, the, the main trunk road network, uh, we, we've trialled uh, low-cost sensors, uh, which relatively are relative to the, uh, the, the reference equipment that SEPA uh, will provide. So reference equipment might be 20 to 30,000 pounds. A low-cost sensor might be in the region of, say, 500 to three, 4,000 pounds. We've trialled that technology uh, on the trunk road network. Uh, we've I give an example. We've used it uh, when the uh, fourth road bridge was closed. Uh, so we deployed those sensors uh, at relatively high speed. So they were deployed within a week uh, and it's just to the north of Kincardine Bridge to see whether there was any trends in the air quality uh, as a result of the, the, the bridge closing. The, and I should say the air quality, the low cost air quality sensors, they're not meant to replace reference equipment. That's not the purpose of them. It's simply to hi highlight whether there's a trend in the movement of, of air quality. So we, we're, we're more than interested in the, the low cost sensors on the trunk road network. Um, in relation to industrial activities, um, SEPA issues permits under the various uh, legal regimes such as pollution prevention and control uh, for operators to operate their activities within specified limits and controls. Um, so a permit will, uh, in all likelihood, have emission limit values uh, for discharges into the atmosphere. Um, most operators are required to monitor uh, on a frequent basis in accordance with the terms of their condition uh, of the permits. And also, it's the case that SEPA assesses compliance with those permits via inspections, monitoring, um, those kind of things. For activities which don't fall into SEPA's remit, um, there's the potential for regulation under the Clean Air Act. So those are responsible uh, for activities such as small-scale emitters of potential uh, pollutants such as smoke, dust, grit, and the local authority is the enforcing agency for those. Um, and to take it down further, a further level, um, where um, air pollution may be considered to be a nuisance um, under the Environmental Protection Act, local authorities also have powers to investigate what are called statutory nuisances. So these are very localized, small-scale emissions. Um, 
SEPA doesn't have any regulatory remit over the Clean Air Act or uh, statutory nuisance. There's a clear legal break between um, our regulatory duties and the local authorities' regulatory duties. I've, I've got two questions. One, I want to go back to, to the monitors on, on the A75. So did you play any part in, for example, uh, there's new attitude traffic lights going to be installed in the middle of, middle of a village, which the A75 travels through right through the middle of. I, I, I would imagine there'll be some impact of traffic starting and stopping where it doesn't at the moment. Does anyone get involved in actually looking at the, the implications with regards to installing a scheme like that when it comes to, to air quality? Pass, I think, is, is the answer I would start with that. I think the, the, the solutions that we would look at for somewhere like Creef would require us to look at not just the traffic light signals, but the road alignment, uh, the speeds, for example, that are going through, the parking arrangements, uh, which may be incredibly unpopular um, and might not be deliverable. Uh, I think there's then the, the elements of looking uh, in a space like Creef to the east and west. So is there a, a a way that the, the traffic can be managed so that the flow of traffic going through the, uh, the town of Creef is, uh, is at a place where the pollution levels can drop uh, purely by the density of vehicles moving through. So, yeah, we would get involved in the, the, the management of the, the trunk road asset uh, where required. It's, uh, it, 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 it's somewhat disappointing or, or surprising that there's not some trigger for where, uh, again, I'm back to the A75, it's a major trunk road with uh, a far higher than an average level of uh, HGVs, which are, are, are considerable emitters of um, pollutants. There's, there's a scheme going to be in, installed there, which, uh, in the face of it, is supposed to help with the health and well-being of the community to stop traffic speeding within yards of buildings. And there's been no consideration of what the impact of a uh, potentially an increase in and pollutants with the start and stop of vehicles. <coughs> Is there no trigger for, for that when there's other consultations going on? I know you've, you've talked about grief, but obviously that hasn't happened uh, in Dumfries and Galloway. It, it's not a particular situation I'm uh, familiar with, so I won't comment on the, the specifics of it, but a local authority has to assess when conducting its annual assessment of um, air quality, any significant proposals or developments which may have um, an impact on air quality. Um, so I can certainly check to see that Dumfries and Galloway's pr uh, report for this current year to see whether that's been mentioned in there, because they may have um, taken account for it, and it may be that they're... The, the emissions may not be significant enough for um, additional measures to be required. But uh, as I say, I don't know the specifics of it, but I can certainly report back to the okay. committee. Right. Just a, a final point on that. Uh, you, you know, you've said you've, you've got powers under Section 85 of the Environment Act. Um, have you ever considered using them? And, and do you believe that enforcement provision should be created to allow you to do that? Well, to date, SEPA hasn't approached Scottish ministers to use the Section 85 powers, um, primarily because we've, we've always tried to work in conjunction with local authorities in a, in a partnership approach. Um, it's, it's also the case, as there aren't any specific enforcement or penalty provisions associated with Section 85, the question then becomes, is there any point using them because ultimately there's no recourse uh, for SEPA to... Um, take action against the local authority. So it, it's, it's possibly the fact that we haven't used them because there isn't a penalty provision, but whether that would actually make things more effective, I'm not actually sure. I think the, I think the relationship that SEPA currently has with local authorities is very good, and I think it's always better to work in a more constructive um, way with local authorities. Th th there are no local authorities um, that we at this, this time would even consider using Section 85 powers on because the performance is very good in relation to the provisions of the Act itself. So I, I, I don't think uh, the specific enforcement provisions would actually be beneficial. Thank you. Emma Harper. Thank you. It's just a quick sub, Convener. Um, uh, convener mentions airports and air quality and Finlay Carson talks about the freight on the 75. So the port of Cairn Ryan, I'm aware, is being monitored for its air quality. And I'm actually waiting on a response from DNG Council about 
is that you know what is the level of pollution but what is being done or what can be done around about ferry ports as far as freight and idling lorries and lots of cars and vehicles so it's kind of similar to convener's question about airports it's a difficult one um because um they are there to ports are there ports are there essentially to take traffic go traffic um, so um, I, I'm not quite sure if you can minimise the, the use of the, uh, the roads. Uh, that's the thing I plan I would try and do, but there might, I don't know if there's other um, things that could be done, um, which are more mitigation. Yeah, I mean, uh, purely in terms of the, the engine technology that's used by the, the haulage industry now for freight, the, the Euro 6 engines uh, that are used uh, are, are a lot cleaner now than uh, they were historically. And the, the Euro 6 engines within freight has been proven to work in the real world at the level that they should work at, rather than what they should work, or in theory should work in a, in a laboratory. So the freight sector, uh, in terms of their use of Euro 6, is, are moving, uh, if not using Euro 6 just now, are moving towards that type of engine te uh, exhaust technology that is as clean as it can be. Uh, I guess I'd pass on the, the elements of idling. At the, um, if, if the local authority do um, after conducting monitoring, find the potential or um, a potential exceedance or an actual exceedance, and they are required to declare an air quality management area, which then kicks into, uh, uh, into place the development of an air quality action plan where you would look at specific measures which are required to bring that particular area back into compliance with the, the, the Scottish objectives. So it, it really is a case of once a problem is found, then the measures kick in. Before that, it's really up to the local authority to implement any measures, potentially to avoid creating a local air quality management area as well. Okay. Um, let's say I'm a member of the public who sees an older uh, lorry or bus chugging along a road, apparently spewing out a lot of fumes. Um, what scope do I have to report my concerns that that those vehicles are damaging the air quality, who do I go to and what happens next? Um, I think that's the remit of the local authority. Uh -huh. and, but I, I have to confess, I'm, I, I'm not aware of the procedure that may be in place for a member of the public reporting that. Yeah, I think it's the same. You report to the uh, environmental health within the, the local authority to get uh, the, the voice heard. Uh -huh. and, and what powers do the local authority have around this? It's just important to get this on the record. Well, I think that that's the, the starting point for the, the monitoring regimes that the local authorities have, albeit within existing air quality management areas. I think that the challenge is where those areas are not declared as, as air quality management areas uh, to, to act as a catalyst to get the, the, the local authorities to look at uh, at those spaces. So, so, so to be clear, cool, let's say there's a fleet of lorries or a fleet of buses owned by a particular company that it would appear are problematic. There's no direct opportunity to, to address that. It has to be gone through the, this whole process. That, that's my understanding, is that it would have to go to the local authority to make a, a, a call on the, the level of impact. Okay. Okay, let's explore this, this bus issue because we hear about the needs for incentives and public support to bring about um, changes in some of these vehicles. You know, we have the Green Bus Fund. We talk, hear about incentives for retrofitting. Mostly national government. I think Glasgow City Council introduced a retrofitting scheme some years ago as well, which had little take-up. I guess my question is, that's all, all, all very well and good, but what about the moral obligation for some of these bus companies. Now, there are some great examples, let's acknowledge that. But what about the moral obligation um, of these bus companies? I mean, why should the public bus partially, largely, completely um, be used to um, tackle uh, air pollution that's being perpetrated by private businesses? Yeah, I, th I think the, the bus sector is, from what we can see, is doing uh, its fair bit to improve the, the, the fleet across Scotland. Uh, we have, I think, over 10% of the, the buses in Scotland just now are uh, Euro 6 or better uh, in terms of uh, their emissions. The, 
there, there are a number of operators that are actively looking to improve uh, their fleet uh, to either Euro 6 or uh, hybrid vehicles or, in, in the case of Edinburgh, fully electric. Uh, I think there's a combination of the work that's been done through the Green Bus Fund, as it is just now, and uh, the submissions that have gone to Mr Mackay uh, for the, the spending review uh, to support uh, work on low emission zones, and a big proportion of that would go to uh, the, the, the greening of the, the fleets. Uh, I think the, the, the bus sector are uh, extremely aware of the, the challenges that they have around about uh, air pollution. Uh, and in fact, I know from speaking to operators, they themselves have talked about the obligations that they have to increase their patronage uh, by offering a service that is, uh, is efficient but also uh, meets environmental credentials of the passengers that they're, they're wanting to carry. Uh, okay. Well, what would you say uh, in response to some of the concerns that have been raised with us in the course of our inquiries, that potentially where you introduce a low emission zone, you could, in theory, have the bus companies ensuring that the vehicles that are um, operating in those zones are compliant, but uh, move the pollutant vehicles into other parts of, of say, major cities? Yeah, I think the, the, the design that we've seen with low emission zones right, right across Europe is that they, they are focused on a particular geography, but the, if taking the buses, for example, the buses that move in and out of the low emission zones don't tend to just operate in the low emission zones, they move out into the suburbs as well. So the gains by having the, the emission standards set within the LEZ actually ripple out beyond uh, the, uh, the, the boundary of, of the LEZs, and we've seen that uh, in, in, in many cities across, uh, across Europe. So that is one of the, the approaches that we'd be looking to introduce into Scotland's four big cities, uh, which is what was stated in, in the programme for government. So I think the, the second part to that is about the, the emission load that, that certain spaces can carry. So in the, 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 the centres of the, of the big cities where LEZs may be set, set up, the LEZ mitigation is there to control the, the, the access or create those access restrictions because the pollution load is at a certain level. Out with and beyond, the, there's a carrying capacity within the, the natural environment uh, to dilute the, the pollutant effects of not just buses, but any type of vehicle. OK. Mark Ruskell. So what modelling has been done to look at numbers of buses that will have to be retrofitted in order to meet the, the needs of these this initial tranche of four low emission zones and what kind of budget is required then uh, well, to again, deliver that? In, in two parts then, so uh, Graham's already mentioned about the, the work that the National Modelling Framework uh, has been uh, put in place. Uh, we've collected uh, traffic data, quite detailed traffic data for the four cities in Scotland, so Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Dundee to underpin uh, that air quality modelling. Uh, if I can use Glasgow as an example, because that's the, the, the first LEZ, the, the, the modelling has uh, suggested that there could be upwards uh, of round about 1,000 buses that we could be looking at, uh, coming depending on the space, obviously, of how the LEZ is set up. Uh, we, if you want to focus specifically on buses, the, the upgrade of a, a bus from, say, a, an old Euro 3 bus to a, a modern uh, uh, Euro 6 diesel could be anywhere from about 200 to 230,000 pounds. If you're looking at retrofitting, you could be looking at round about f anywhere between 10 to 16,000 pounds. Uh, 15,000, I think, seems to be the average. Uh, so you can start multiplying those numbers up to get an idea, assuming that it all comes out the public purse for uh, what we could be looking at just for the uh, for the bus sector. But it's a substantial figure. Mm -hmm. I think, I think it would be useful, convener, if, if the committee could get hold of the, the exact details yep. of numbers um, of buses that might need to be retrofitted and, and potential budget. The, we, we can certainly provide that. And I think it's, it's somewhat dependent on the size of the LEZs as well. If the LEZs start small and then grow in size over, over a period of time, then the number of buses that would have to be retrofitted over that time period as well would expand uh, as, as the LEZs grow uh, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, the change in size. So what Mr Roscoe has just requested, which is a very good idea, if you could provide any evidence of the bus companies playing their part in the costs of retrofitting, etc., because it would be useful to get a handle on the extent to which that's going on. Let's tease out this uh, low emission zone um, 
Subject to David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I ask a few more concentrated questions about LEZs? Uh, in the panel's view, will there be a pilot LEZ next year? Why? <laughs> uh, well, firstly, because it's a, it is a stated programme for government commitment to put the first uh, LEZ in place uh, by the end of 2018. Uh, that's certainly what my team within Transport Scotland has been tasked uh, to deliver. Uh, and we're in actively now setting up the, uh, the LEZ delivery groups and the LEZ leadership groups uh, that will be chaired by ministers to, to make sure that that's delivered uh, on the ground. Uh, so, we, yeah, we, we will aim to deliver that. that. That's what we've been tasked to do and on behalf of ministers, and that's what we will do. Can I ask the other panellists? I'll take Stephen's word for it. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, I... I I also believe there will be an LEZ in place by 2018. Uh, CEPA is working very closely with Transport Scotland and Scottish Government um, in providing the evidence base for the, the various um, scenarios. Mm. And um, I, yeah, I, I don't see any, any uh, particular barriers to us not achieving the, the stated aims. Mm. Just looking at some of the evidence that the committee um, has looked at from local authorities and others, just to give you a snapshot of some of the comments that we've had. Um, first of all, a lack of guidance needs more time, timescale challenging, no information and implementation plans, and Euro 6, this is obviously from bus company, not possible at this time. Um, I personally support LEZs, I think it's very ambitious and I've looked very carefully at what's happened in London. I have got real concerns about this happening next year, and I particularly think, Stephen, you've been, been very forthright in this, and clearly that's part of your responsibility. It seems to me there's some worries from local authorities about this actually happening, because frankly, some local authorities and the correspondence I've, I've had are not sure what they're bidding into. Would you, would you share that issue, that they have some worries about what is the scheme going to be about and what the role of local authorities are in devising LEZs? Yeah, I, I think this, I've heard the phrase, this is the new new, mentioned several times in, in low emission zones in Scotland, and that's correct. The, the, this will be the first uh, low emission zone that we're putting uh, in place in Scotland, the, my, my mind always goes back to the, the time scale uh, in terms of delivering LEZs. So, from use in three parts, there is the, the time scale starts when the local authority publishes the design for the LEZ. So that's the first part. The second part is then when the LEZ uh, goes live. So uh, in Scotland, we've committed to put it in place by the end of 2018. So that's the second part, and then the third part is when the LEZ enforcement begins. So it's crucial in all of this that in terms of the development of lead-in times that there's a, not a confusion between the LEZ going live at the end of 2018 and the enforcement beginning in terms of a, if it is a penalty regime mm. that, that, that comes mm. out, that that starts on the, immediately on the same day. Mm. We believe that that will not be the case. So there's a three-stage approach to the, to the rollout of, of LEZs, mm. and the lead-in time for that is one of the components that's been discussed just now uh, within the, the, the mm. Building Scotland's Low Emissions Zone consultation that's live just now. Mm. I, I would be worried if local authorities didn't have concerns about LEZs. Uh, I'm, I'm relying on them to, to, to come up with as many questions as possible so we can iron them out before mm. the first is rolled out. Could I ask about technology? And, and clearly London has been leading the way in the UK in this issue. Uh, and certainly speaking, it's unfortunate we couldn't have gone ahead with our first panel today, but nevertheless, I mean, in London, if I understand it correctly, I mean, it's been around 100 million to set this up, and that they have got um, technology, which is vehicle recognition number plates. Yeah. Uh, that is very, very expensive. Um, does that exist in, for example, if it's going to be Glasgow, it's being quoted as the pilot. Does that exist currently? If not, is the, is the budget or the technology there to recognise vehicles automatically as they enter an LEZ? Yeah, okay. So, uh, again, uh, there's, there's a couple of points to, to that. The, the first is that the, the AMPR technology is, is used uh, well in Scotland and, and is widespread in Scotland. It's used for bus lane uh, mm -hmm. enforcement. Uh, and, for example, Glasgow uh, is one of many cities that has bus lane cameras already set up. So the technology itself is not new. It's mm -hmm. pretty mature and is mm -hmm. well understood by, by local authorities. Uh, the cost of the, the, the technology actually in terms of setting up LEZs is not the biggest component part. That is the, the, the cost to the, the upgrading of the, of the fleet and supporting the upgrading of the fleet. So the, the con actual physical construction uh, and uh, of the, the EMPR cameras and the, 
and the wiring that, 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 that that's based on is, is not the biggest part of, of the LEZ costs. That said, the bus lane technology that is used is, is for that particular purpose. So if the MPR is, is the, the route that uh, Scottish ministers decide to, to use for, for LEZs, and that does seem to be the, the, the element that we've proposed in, in the consultation, then the, there will be a need for the, the rollout of that, that camera technology in the spaces within the cities that, that we are talking about. Uh, I guess there's then a question of whether that technology is fixed all the time, or whether it can be mobile, or whether it's a mix of those. And again, mm -hmm. those are, I'm hoping that's what we'll find out through the consultation of, of whether there is a need for uh, just permanent cameras or a mix of, of mobile cameras as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the key issues, and which has perhaps had an element of greater controversy, is whether um, older polluting private vehicles should also be included. And we've seen examples in the past. For example, the referendum here in Edinburgh on congestion charging was was defeated. I'm not making an argument one way or the other. I'm really making the point that uh, whilst I think we all in this room understand the worries about pollution in Scotland, it's also about how you implement it by bringing in private vehicles, which obviously are polluting you also raise the bar in terms of opposition. What's the Transport Scotland take on that particular issue? Um, well, in, in terms of the discussions that we've had with ministers, the, we've been very clear that we want uh, LEZs, uh, ministers want LEZs to be bold and ambitious, uh, to cover uh, a mix of, of, of vehicles that includes private cars. So there has to be a reason for those types of vehicles to not be included within uh, low emission zones. And again, that's what we've stated in the, the, the consultation. The, the bold and ambitious element then links into uh, the, the science that backs up the, 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 the rationale for a particular vehicle to be included within an LEZ. Uh, there's also uh, additional uh, secondary uh, elements that could, could be included in terms of uh, encouraging modal shift that we've heard about this morning. Mm. Uh, and part of that is to move you know, people out of private cars and into other forms of mm. transport. Mm -hmm. uh, the bus sector, uh, again, are, are very clear that they want uh, journey time reliability to be improved. And a part of that is to have fewer cars on the road uh, mm. and to get those people who are in those cars into mm. public transport. And within the decision making, we're obviously talking next year to be hopefully Glasgow as the pilot and then the other three cities thereafter, I think 2020. Within that, would local authorities have the power to have a local referendum to decide whether they will go ahead with an LEZ, or is this a decision that's going to be made at Scottish Government level? It will happen, uh, and local government's just got to go along with it. Well, the, the, the decision that local authorities have got within the, the, the control of transport within their local space is for the local authorities to decide. Uh, the, the local authorities that we've spoken to uh, so far for, the, for those four big cities particularly Glasgow and Edinburgh, have uh, publicly committed to, to low emission zones. So this is what we, we believe elected members are, are wanting to push forward. And we're, we've got uh, meetings already planned with, Gla uh, with uh, Aberdeen and Dundee, uh, local authorities as well, uh, to gauge their interest on in moving from uh, a feasibility to, to, of LEZs into the published political commitment to, to LEZs. You've no, you've, there's no suggestion in your discussion with local authorities that they will require a local referendum to uh, go ahead with this? Not, not quite the, the referendum. The, the discussions that we've had so far with Glasgow and Edinburgh uh, have been around uh, the need for further uh, consultation on the, the, the city-specific designs for, for LEZs. So the LEZ consultation that we have right now is round about the, the guiding principles around national standards for LEZs. But I would imagine if the, the, the design of the, the Glasgow LEZ that's been worked on right now, I would imagine that there will be a need or desire for a, a local consultation by Glasgow on the, the design of that very specific, specific city-specific uh, LEZ as well. Uh, and finally, convener, should, should emissions be reduced per passenger or per vehicle? can tell you what I think we, sh we, sh we have to do in terms of what's measurable, which is uh, uh, per, per uh, vehicle, because that's what's measured coming out of the tailpipe. Although, so that, that's what we can measure in terms of the, the, the equipment that we have right now. The, the cer certainly there's been several publications by Professor Begg uh, over the, the, the last year, which has made 
uh, extremely strong cases for to look at the additional metrics of uh, per per head, uh, and of course that's from a, a bus sector perspective of moving one person out of a car or moving 70 people out of 70 cars into into one bus. So th there is a rationale for looking at that metric as well. Right. Thank you, Convener. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Richard Lyle. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, before we move off. Um, um, LEZ. Can I ask, and Stephen Thompson actually commented on it, but I'd like to ask um, Graham Applegate. CPA, I believe, have done some modelling on low emission zones. Can I ask you about the findings of the CPA model and whether other vehicle classes, as uh, Stephen Thompson touched on, should be needed to be included uh, from the outset in low emission zones? Um, CPA has uh, conducted the modelling for the, for the four cities and primarily uh, concentrated on Glasgow as being the first low emission zone um, to be in place. Um, the findings themselves, I can uh, submit a, a report to the committee on the very specific findings, but um, in general terms, um, it was found that the buses for Glasgow are the greatest contributor to NO2 pollution and um, reducing emissions from them would have the greatest immediate impact on air quality in the city. Um, in relation to uh, cars themselves, um, there would potentially be benefits for congestions and number of journeys taken, but the air quality benefits would not be as significant as for buses themselves. So the model itself can run various scenarios based on the, the vehicle fleet and the, the levels of pollution and determine which, which are the most appropriate vehicles to target in the first instance. But it is the case that while the main or the initial focus may be on buses, then other vehicle classes will come into any LEZ in, in the future. Thanks for that. Um, can I turn to the questions that I really want to ask? Um, as you already have said, we, we visited Kerstorfen last week. The Community Council uh, is quite uh, uh, busy in this subject but they're, they're not too uh, happy, and they've actually said we've, we've seen no meaningful reduction in persistent air quality issues in our community. And basically, um, the point that we went to in St John Road had a monitor, and it's been there for some time. And the, co the, the comment, I think, uh, Donald Cameron uh, brought up earlier about North Lancashire Council. In North Lancashire Council, at the Civic Centre in Motherwell, a monitor has been there for roughly 20 odd, 25 years, but a lot of councils don't have a lot of monitors. And basically, what I would like to ask are, are the existing monitor stations in the right place? Are they collecting the right data to provide a broad uh, picture of air quality across Scotland? And should there actually be more monitors and a broader coverage? Because I, I think some councils only maybe have three or four areas that are being looked at. That may be not include Transport Scotland monitors also? This question. Um, uh, currently, uh, there are 95 automatic monitors within Scotland and... The, the 95 for 32 councils, so that's roughly three per council. Well, if you want to cut it that way, yes. Um, but those monitors are uh, fulfil two different purposes. We have the, the monitors which are in place um, as a requirement of the EU directive, and then also the monitors which are required uh, to monitor local air quality in the local authority area. And the two reporting mechanisms are slightly different. So the the the, the monitors placed for EU compliance have very strict criteria about where they are placed. Um, the local authority then has more discretion about where they place the other individual monitors. So um, there, there are there are distinct criteria for citing um, uh, these, and they're the, the very expensive installations. You know, so the the, the local authority will place a, a monitor which isn't specified under European criteria in the most appropriate place within its local authority area, and also um, there there will be limited funds for for those monitors. Um, Scottish Government does make available each year um, additional money for the local authorities to, if they need further monitoring, to install further monitoring or to, to look at other aspects. Um, a local authority can also conduct uh, what's called uh, non-automatic monitoring. So this is things such as um, diffusion tubes, which measure, measure the concentration of nitrogen dioxide. So these are smaller 
can be placed um, on lampposts, and there, there's a, a huge amount of data from local authorities um, on this, which they then use in their review and assessment of air quality in their area. Um, it's, it, it's really the case that the, the local authority um, has to determine where monitoring is required and what sort of extent of monitoring is also required. Um, and in most cases, SEPA is uh, content with, with the levels that take place. I mean, it's always the case that more monitoring could be done, and we would welcome more monitoring, but recognising the practicalities of it, I think the, the local authorities are, are, are doing the best job that they can within the financial and practical constraints just, that they Just have. before we allow Stephen Thompson, can I just clarify something? Isn't it the case that, additional to all of that, SEPA has a number of monitors that local authorities can access? Uh, for for sort of temporary monitoring, say outside the school, and wasn't SEPA going to be purchasing additional monitors? Uh, SEPA has got two, um, the effectively trailer monitors, which are used um, for the airborne hazard emergency response uh, capability, which we provide for Scotland. So this is effectively in response to a Bunsfield kind of uh, large-scale industrial incident. So those those trailers. I think are available, but it, it really depends on what uses SEPA may have for them at any particular time, whether they're then available for a local authority. It's also the case that we've um, implemented um, a volcanic emissions network, which is an early warning network, mostly of rural uh, air quality monitoring sites in the northwest of Scotland, and the local authority has access to that data as well. I, I thought there was small scale uh, equipment available in addition to that, that's, for example, for setting up temporary monitoring outside schools. SEPA does have various monitoring equipment available. Um, I, I'm not aware of the process, because I'm not involved with it, of, of a local authority requesting that, um, so I can certainly find out about that and report back. But before Richard Lyle continues, Claudia Beamish wants to come in. Point. Thank you, Convener. Um, it was just, I think, in, in some written ev evidence from SEPA, there, there was a concern that was raised about the difficulties um, or potential difficulties of, of assessing the local authority and the EU directive, um, uh, the, the, the compliance with air quality, um, and uh, that, that they are different. And if the data sets are different, I'm just wondering how, how that can be um, tackled in the future. It, it, it's the case that the, the EU directive has very specific reporting requirements which are outlined within the directive itself. Um, local air quality management um, works to fulfil a lot of the requirements of the EU directive, but the, there are slight mismatches between the two. So the two, while they almost fulfil the same obligations, they can't be considered to be directly comparable. So it, it's... More than anything, it's just the context at which you view the, the monitoring data from the two regimes. So they are broadly comparable, but the, it must be recognised that there are significant differences as well. Yeah, just to go back to the, the previous point, the, there's potentially the use of modelling to underpin and maybe even go beyond the power of what, what site-specific monitoring can, can achieve. I think it was in the Netherlands have taken an approach to use... Uh, strategic air quality modelling within their legislation to uh, identify whether air quality has been breached or not. And we actually do this in Scotland, but from a noise perspective. So the strategic noise mapping that we undertake, we don't measure site-specific noise levels to undertake noise mapping. We do that through modelling. So there's potentially an approach in Scotland that we could uh, adopt in terms of using modelling across the, the, the spaces, which would potentially be a lower cost than the monitoring but cover a much wider area uh, and there's potentially again a, a plethora of data sets that could underpin that modelling so the, 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 the robustness of, of that approach would arguably underpin or support the, the site specific monitoring regime that we already have. Thank you. Mr Lyle, sorry. Yes, um, so basically what I'm finding out of what the, you're telling the committee is that the monitoring uh, equipment that we have in Scotland is, the number is woeful. Um, basically 95, two major units that you could, uh, I don't know how many Transport Scotland uh, units there are, but the, the next question I'd like to ask is, uh, can we be certain that actions that are taken to in, improve air quality near known hotspots, and I'm reminded, and based on a, a question made by the convener, I'm reminded that as you, sometimes you drive along the road, you see the, D, the DVLA with a, an environmental 
officer with someone from Transport Scotland, with maybe a policeman stopping cars and checking their exhaust fume uh, quality, etc. So maybe, but I only see that occasionally. I haven't seen it recently, so maybe we need more of that. But basically, the question is: Might visible air quality information next to monitoring stations be better at Kirstorf? And um, I asked uh, one of the the, the committee uh, um, to uh, put their, their phone near the, the the data, and it showed up right away. Shouldn't we not have a sign above that says air quality today is X or um, the reading is Y, um, so that people can actually see? Um, similar to as you go along, you have uh, you know reduce your speed now, or you're in a 30 zone, um, you're doing 40. Should we not have that on monitors also? The woeful number of amount of what monitors that we do have. Uh, well, I, that's probably a matter for the Scottish Government and the local authorities. But um, the, the one um, caution I would hazard is that the, the data which comes from these monitoring stations is always provisional. So it eventually has to go through a validation and ratification process. Um, so the data is potentially subject to change based on that process. So that, that kind of information would be indicative until such time as the data set was ratified. Um, the, I don't know what the practicalities or the costs of that would be. I know SEPA's uh, has something similar for the bathing waters um, uh, down the Ayrshire coast to, to indicate what the, the water quality is like, but I, I have to confess I, I'm not aware of how we, we would do that in practical terms. The, I might be wrong in this, but the air quality website has, uh, the app for the air quality website has an access to the the monitoring stations across Scotland. Yeah. So it gives the, albeit it's not presented at that specific location, but there is access to that air quality data. So I wonder if that could be moved, albeit maybe not in a real time, maybe there's a 24-hour a delay or a time delay, but that data could potentially be... Uh, be but if you're available. watching the weather forecast on the television, they tell you whether, in fact, you know, um, uh, uh, certain information, <coughs> um, you know, so could we not... We don't need to have a, a number. Could it just say air quality good today or air quality uh, bad or, or whatever? Stephen has said that the, the air quality website run by the Scottish Government does have um, an air quality forecast, um, which goes for four days hence. Um, but um, due to the variability of things like meteorological conditions, that's subject to change. So it, it should always be um, just taken as an indicator um, and that, that's available in the, in the same location as the individual monitoring data. Um, and to, to go with that, there is associated health guidance on the potential health impacts or what uh, members of the population should do where air quality may not be in the, in the highest um, category. Um, so it, it has to be treated with caution because it is, can be subject to change. And, Air quality forecasting is sort of a, it's not comparable to weather forecasting in the, in the same way. We certainly don't want to get the same as China. We don't want to be walking about with masks. No. But can I also turn to a subject which I, I don't think has, has been covered? Um, what further can we do to improve air quality? Surely it's not just down to transport. We also have, uh, we still have some factories left in this country that are producing. We still have some factories that are belching out um, stuff out their chimneys. And okay, the chimneys are maybe high, but you go along on a cold day and you see the, 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 them bel belching out. So what can we do? Does SEPA, now SEPA, remind me, SEPA is Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. That's what you, you should be protecting the population in Scotland from environmental uh, harm. So basically that's your, your job. Um, so how are you doing your job and are you checking factories that people are complaining about, in particular um, uh, in industrial estates and do you have concern over, sorry to bring it up, uh, it's coming, coming to my area, hopefully not shortly, incinerators. Do you um, look at these along with the planning uh, 
um, situation in order to uh, protect people from other forms of pollution, not just transport pollution? SEPA does protect and enhance the environment in as far as our legal duties allow us. So, for example, we aren't responsible for local air quality. That's the local authority. So within the terms of what we can do, we are protecting and improving the environment, and I'd like to think we're doing a very good job of it. Um, in relation to specific um, industrial activities, as I mentioned previously, um, each one which falls under the terms of the legislation, that's very important to remember, there are some activities which don't fall into the legislation and therefore aren't regulated by SEPA. Um, we do issue licenses, permits, we conduct compliance inspections, monitoring, we respond to public complaints um, and concerns. And, but those are all very strictly defined in the terms of the legislation. So that covers the larger scale industrial activities, waste management activities, um, those kind of things. Domestic activities. It was suggested to the committee previously that uh, the growth in wood burning stoves, particularly in urban environments, was uh, a contributory factor that was worthy of consideration, but nobody could really quantify the scale of that. Is that something that's on your radar? Not really, no. The, the, the legislation defines the capacity under which any kind of combustion um, is regulated by SEPA. So where it falls below that level, then it, uh, the, the uh, regulation and enforcement actually falls to local authorities um, because it's seen as too small for SEPA to worry about. There is a, a, a currently um, an EU directive being transposed, which is called the Medium Combustion Plant Directive, which should close up some of the gaps in relation to biomass combustion. But very small scale um, domestic would ultimately be the local authority's responsibility under either the Clean Air Act or the Environmental Protection Act. Raise that question slightly differently. I didn't mean was it you know, your responsibility, mm -hmm. but was it an issue that you were cited on? Are you aware that this may be a contributory factor that we might want Certain, to be considering? Yeah, certainly through the local authority um, review and assessment of air quality in their area, we have uh, there is some quantification of the potential for biomass emissions to impact on that area's um, air quality. Um, at the moment, it, 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 I don't think it's uh, anywhere near the scale of, say, for example, London, but there is the potential for these things to expand quite considerably in the future. Um, so it's definitely something keeping a watching brief on, okay. but at the moment it, it is just there. Okay, thank you. It's useful to get that right up. Uh, David Stewart. Uh, additional point as far as air quality is concerned uh, the panel may have seen the recent BBC news uh, program about how toxic is your tar exhaust and it found official estimates of vehicle emissions produced under test conditions are not replicated uh, on the road and that obviously affects the London and Paris clean vehicle checker is that any implications for your work it's not from SEPA's perspective, no, um, but it will have implications on uh, the CAF's uh, process and also the modelling because obviously we're, we're feeding data into the into the model based on either real world or laboratory testing so uh, we need to we need to be sort of cognizance of the where the disparities may may occur but hopefully with the, the, the change in the, the test cycles over the forthcoming years then th those gaps should close and we get a, a greater understanding of the real world driving conditions we've actually spoken to greater london authority and emission analytics because they are combined are creating what's called the EQUA index. And that is, I think it's what the index that you're talking about is the, 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 the disparity between uh, real world emissions by vehicles that might be very new through to, to, to quite old uh, in comparison to what the, the, the emission standards stay, say on the, uh, on the tin, so to speak. So I know Greater London Authority are looking at publishing the EQUA index so that individuals can type in their uh, registration number or their vehicle type and get an indication of what, you know, for example, a, a seven-year-old Ford Focus might be in comparison to a, a brand-new Ford Focus. Uh, we, we're, we're exploring that just now in terms of what that might, might bring to, to Scotland. Uh, there's, and then there's a second tier on that in terms of the the setting of uh, emission standards w within low emission zones. Uh, what we, the powers that we have, uh, or the, the, the basis on which we can set those are based on the, the Euro standards, uh, which are uh, right across Europe. Uh, and in that, in an interest of fairness, that's how we'd be able to judge uh, basically everyone in this room's car, uh, 
fairly. But we, we're, we're curious about what the equine index could, could bring to the table. So there would be a difference between... You would do it on what the Ford Focus seven-year-old lab condition says, but the, the seven-year-old Ford Focus in reality might have a much higher emission. That's the problem. Potential it? it could do, yes. Yeah. So what's the implications for the Glasgow pilot next year if that goes ahead at that, that time scale? Well, the, the, the modelling that we're, we're using just now is based on uh, a combination of the, the traffic data that we've collected uh, and the, the, the air quality uh, data that we have uh, already. Uh, the, I think there's, there's a need for ongoing monitoring to prove that the, what's achieved in the real world is actually realised uh, in the real world. Uh, and that will be one of the, I think, under, one of the underpinning tenants of, of of any form of air quality mitigation, to prove that it does work in the real world. Mm, thank you. Thank you. And finally, in this section, Finlay Carson. Just back to, it was interesting what you said about uh, uh, the use of modelling. You know, we've now got um, monitors all over the country for air temperature, pressure, humidity, and whatever, which can give us an idea of what uh, estimated air pollution is, and even things like pollen counts and whatever. We have databases that contain lots of information. Um, you know, what you were back to the, the information about the, was it Aqua, you call it? I think it's called Equa. Equa. So, uh, and we also have MOT information, which is recorded uh, centrally through a database. Um, the auto automatic number plate recognition systems are relatively cheap. Uh, they can, they're portable, you can move them about and install them at, at short notice. Is there any joined up thinking between all these different agencies? So MOT uh, reports are sent back, uh, we've got speed detectors in the cars, whatever. So you can do far more modelling that would rule out the need for expensive air quality monitors. Because ultimately, um, you know, we've got computers and lots of data. Is that not something SEPA, uh, Transport Scotland, DVLA and whoever can all work together so that even in the smallest communities, so in Spring Home, if the traffic lights are, uh, the, the way they th the, the sequences work or whatever, it could be very quick and almost instant to work out what the air quality implications are. Is that something that the, the, the different agencies do to work together? I think there's more to be done. I think the, we, we are... Well, the fact that we're, we're putting the, the likes of CAFs together several years ago shows that we're starting to, to work together. Uh, there's more that can be done. The, I think one of the biggest challenges is to get hold of the big data sets. Uh, and what I mean by that is the, the data sets that, for example, uh, Police Scotland hold on terms of uh, EMPR data sets. I think they have probably well over 100 million data points and it, rightly so, it's protected under privacy. But could that data be used in, in, a, in a, a, a private cleansed form to underpin the modelling? I don't know. It potentially could do. There's private companies that have data sets, the likes of TomTom, uh, Uber, uh, have uh, real-time data on, in terms of the way that their vehicles move. Uh, we, for example, we had a meeting with uh, Minister for Transport, had a meeting with Uber, uh, several weeks ago, and they, they had said that they are, in theory, have the potential to provide that, that data in a, a private and confidential manner. There's data from the bus companies in terms of how they move around. The, the modern uh, ticket machines that are being installed are all GPS-based. So, again, there's another form of, of data that could be used to, to underpin the modelling. So, I think in Scotland, the data sets, the big data sets are there. There's questions around it about the privacy but if we could get access to those, the, the, the granularity and the modelling would be far superior to where it is just now. Towards digital cities where we could be potentially looking at congestion charges, uh, air quality charges, parking charges, where everything's done automatically. Uh, who's, who's leading on this? Who's pushing it or facilitating the discussions that would, would see that come about? The digital cities and the smart cities agenda has been led by lots of different people. That's probably one of the, one of the problems, some by private companies and some by uh, the public sector. There's an interesting organisation based in London called Future Cities Catapult, which is, I saw a presentation from them last week, which is looking very much about how we use data um, and how we can use it much more effectively, how we can map it, and also some of the ethics around that as well, as, as, as Stephen's already alluded to. So I think there's a need to try and see how we can do that. I know as, as part of the planning review, um, 
Scottish Government's uh, put in place a, a digital transformation task force which involves organisations such as that to look at the data issue and how we can use it much in a much smarter way than we do just now. And I, I personally think it can be game changing. Okay. Moving on, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Um, I'd like to focus our minds on tackling air quality hotspots. And we had um, interesting written evidence um, on a range of measures in relation to prioritising air quality improvement in areas that have had persistent breaches of um, NOT, uh, NO2 um, limit values. Um, I wonder, I, I don't really like the phrase quick wins, but in terms of, um, I can't think of a better one, for, um, in terms of air pollution, um, are, there, are there initiatives um, that could be implemented which aren't necessarily included in the CAFs or um, in, the, in the local air quality action plans. And a couple of the suggestions, I won't raise things that have come up uh, already today, but planting an installation, well, we, it has come up in a sense, but planting um, uh, an installation of green infrastructure in terms of planning, particularly. Um, and the, it says the use of dust suppressants, issuing subsidised um, public travel passes and I understand that a lot of that isn't within the gift of, of those who are on the panel today but I wonder if you've got any comment on them and also on, on uh, the setting of expectations for, um, for local authorities and planners in terms of uh, taking forward that, those types of initiatives. I think things which you mentioned, such as um, sort of temporary planting and, and green infrastructure, and, and trying to do that. We've seen the, the rise of pop-up parks, for example, um, and things like that in cities. I think they're all incredibly useful, and, and they can at least raise the awareness of the issue as well, as much as anything, as, as well as have an impact. So I think there are useful things there. The one thing I, I would guard against, ever is thinking that the quick wins are going to be the, 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 the total solution to this. Um, and as I've already said, I think one of the things from a planning perspective, certainly, is that we need to realise that a lot of this is going to be in the medium to longer term, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. We shouldn't get frustrated by the fact that it's going to take a wee bit longer for some of these things to turn around. So I, I would keen, and I would be keen that we, we also realise that we need to work in a proactive way uh, to, to make this work, to try and minimise travel issues at the start rather than actually deal with them reactively. Yeah, I'll um, I, th I think it's, it's always going to be the case that you will never just have one solution to improve an air quality problem, and it will always require a suite of measures, whether they're hard measures, softer measures. Um, and uh, so I, I, I don't think the quick wins are, are there. It's also the case that, that the levels of pollution that we're now trying to get down below, the quick wins have gone because it was industrial point sources and large-scale activities. So... Um, as Craig says, I think it, it is a medium to long term problem, which a multitude of sh solutions and measures will be required uh, to be implemented to, to solve. Um, the question on expectation, I think, is, is a really interesting one, because I think when CAFS was launched in 2015, everybody sort of expected there to be an, an overnight improvement in air quality. And that was never going to be the case. It's a, it's a long term process. And had it been easy, somebody would have done it before. You know, we're, we're, we're bringing together new people around a new table to try and find new solutions for an old problem. And I think um, the expectation management is, is really important because we need to communicate the medium to long term focus of the strategy and to, to you know, not tell people that everything will be better overnight because it, it, in reality it won't but we're all working towards the common goal over those longer terms and Stephen did you have any yeah. comment on mm, I think if we cast our view beyond Scotland and the UK and look at what some of the, the cities that are aligned to the C40 cities uh, they, they've taken very aggressive approaches which are immediate which is banning cars that, and that, that is one of their solutions uh, Maybe just for a day, you know, once a day, for a week, once a month. Mm. Uh, and it, it, that is extremely aggressive, but it's effective. And it would move people on to the forms of public transport that we, we, we want to see. In terms of medium term, something that hasn't come up today is the possibility of um, consolidation hubs. Um, David Stewart, my colleague, visited one in Holland for 
vehicles um, <coughs> to larger vehicles to go to and then um, and then um, the, the goods to be transferred to go into cities. Has there been any work done on that at all? Yes, I, 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 it's not me specifically, but I know colleagues in Transport Scotland are looking at freight con consolidation centres uh, and I've, I've had ongoing discussions with Freight Transport Association, Road Haulage Association about, uh, again, in several stages, bringing the larger vehicles to those locations and then the, the so-called last mile logistics being undertaken in lower emission or zero emission vehicles. Uh, so the Transport Scotland are actively looking uh, uh, at that topic. Do you perhaps um, get your colleagues to send us something Absolutely. on that? Yep. That would be useful. Thank you. And then, and then just finally, um, Kavina, uh, we've had interesting discussions this morning about a joined up approach, but um, in terms of... Um, uh, some of the written evidence again that we received um, uh, from councils, which was helpful. Um, in relation to accountability, have there been any discussions or would you envisage that um, it was appropriate to consider um, accountability being written into, for instance, the single outcome agreements or um, the joint health protection plans uh, in terms, again, of setting um, the, the vision for the future and the expectations? I would certainly like um, single outcome agreements, local outcome improvement plans, whatever, to, to look at these sort of issues, yeah. And I think that is a way to try and get corporate buy-in. Uh, we, we found from a planning perspective that we tend to be out of the loop on these sort of um, documents. Um, and we've been trying to push, and one of the things in the planning review is push for a, um, a statutory link between community planning and spatial planning, which I think would be very, very useful. So, yeah, I think if we can broaden, um, the amount of, if we want to broaden the number of players involved in that and who have a, a role to play, some of these corporate instruments, I think, are useful ways to try and do that. Slight problem with... with um, SOAs and, and LOIPs is that every man and their dog or every woman and their dog is trying to get their priority in there um, and I know that the people who are trying to draw them up are finding it very very difficult to try and prioritise as to what comes first and what comes after that um, but there's certainly a case for air quality to be in there. Yeah. I think I'd, I'd echo that it wasn't by chance that the, the Minister for Public Health and Sport was included as a uh, within, within CAFs that was very intentional because uh, ultimately I think the the place where the, the dialogue has to go towards is the role of uh, directors of public health and the NHS uh, involved in, because frankly we want less people turning up at their front door. Uh, it's, so the, the engagement of, of those practitioners uh, has has a role to play over the, the, the coming year or so. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard Lyle, finally on this. Just a, a quick question. Sorry, Mr Applegate, I'm going to put you in the spot again. Um, based on your comments today, do you believe that SEPA's powers should be increased in regards to air quality? Um, no, I don't. I, I believe that the, the legal system we have um, is robust um, as, as it currently stands. Um, in, in the past, the, the local air quality aspect has, um, has always been very effective in looking at assessing air quality and identifying where the problems are. The, the issues have always been about implementing solutions and measures. Um, I think CAFS now provides that bridging point to implement the solutions. And I don't, I don't actually see that uh, CEPA having additional responsibility would make that necessarily more effective. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, John Scott. Um, thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, uh, Claudia Beamish is... Uh, articulated very well uh, the vision um, for the future, which uh, I applaud in terms of integrated health care and, and other things, but um, I've been given the series of questions to ask about the barriers that may be out there, um, certainly still exist. Um, and uh, in particular, Aberdeen City Council, uh, in their evidence to us, um, um, said said that the barriers to successful delivery include a lack of financial and staffing resources within the partner organisations responsible for implementing the strategy and local buy-in to potentially unpopular measures such as LEZs, resistance from fleet operators, local businesses, the public and negative local press may also cause conflict. Um, is that a view that you share? If the natural starting point for me is resource, that's real. That was that, going to be my final question. Yes. That that is 
Uh, again, from a personal point of view, that's very real. Uh, it's, so the, the actions that we want to take forward are somewhat dictated by the, the people hours that we have to, to put to those, and that's not an excuse. That's just a reality. Um, if the, the funding is, is being proposed within the, the spending review, so we are looking for new monies to, to be addressed within, within air quality that weren't there before, and I think that's a result of CAFs coming together. So, yes, there's a, a funding pressure there. Uh, there is a, a role for media to play to communicate accurate uh, and concise information. Uh, we, we spend uh, a portion of our time providing uh, press lines that we know are accurate, uh, whether they're reported uh, is another matter. And then that, that uh, messaging uh, can somewhat inf lead to be people being uninformed or misinformed. So there's a responsibility within media to, to make sure that that information is put across concisely. Uh, so, yeah, I would agree with all those three points. I'm not really trying to tempt you into agreeing with things you don't want to, but um, McGill Buses stated that Glasgow wants what London has, but does not want to do what London has had to do to get it. Um, seems possibly like a real-world statement. Um, we're trying, are we trying to do this on the cheap? Here in Scotland, um, that's certainly what McGill buses appear to imply from their evidence. Um, would you agree with that statement? It, it's essentially further to the funding issue. I, th I think funding is essential. Yeah. The, there is that's black and white. Funding is essential, uh, and uh, I would uh, agree with the the roles that, that the likes of McGill's have said in, in their evidence that without appropriate funding. Then we will not be in a place where we where we want to be. Uh, that this requires hard cash and hard investment, uh, along with behaviour change as well. If I could perhaps come in on the, the resourcing side, I know, I know planners aren't the be all and end all in this, although they play an important role. But we said in our evidence that resourcing is a key issue, and, and, and we've done it work to uh, show that between 2009 and 2015, we've lost 23 per cent of, pl of planners in local authorities. Um, so um, if there's a job for planners to work on this in terms of development planning and development management, there's less of them to do it. They're focusing more on the statutory functions which they have to do, which is processing planning applications and publishing development plans. It sometimes doesn't allow for the creativity and the, um, the bits around the edges and talking to your quality colleagues, which they perhaps should be, but they can't do that because they're faced with the uh, real issues around resourcing. So a lack of planners and a lack of money, not a good combination. Yeah, I, I Do think you see other barriers as well, since we're on that? Um, I, I, and, I, and I don't ask it just for the, from the point of view of being negative, um, but um, if there are problems to be solved, it's better that we as a committee also know about them uh, or barriers that need to be overcome. So if there are other things that occur to you that you can articulate easily. I, I think in the resourcing, thought that there's three bits. So that there's a lack of people and bodies, as I've said, there's a lack of budget as well. We've seen the planning services, £40 million taken out of it over that 2010 to 2015 period as well. Um, but there's also a, a, a need to grow expertise in this. And I've, I've said already, we've, tr we've tried to do that with some limited resources, which we have. Other, I know other disciplines and professions are trying to do that as well. But it's about trying to break down those silo barriers um, and trying to make sure that people know how they can work with others. Um, and that's, that's a big, big issue for us all. I, th I think we're getting there with it, absolutely. Um, but uh, sometimes the capacity building element is something which is put to the bottom of the pile, whereas it can often be the key game changer. Mm -hmm. Can I just add yeah, of a, course. A, a, a short point? Um, I think as well, it, it's the case that what CAFS has tried to do is look at the potential multiple benefits that are available. Um, and where uh, another policy area of, say, for example, another source of funding may have positive impacts on air quality, but it's not immediate, immediately apparent to tease that out and try to you know, embed air quality into other non-traditional areas. So to almost try to piggyback on uh, as many uh, re relevant policy areas as possible recognising that air quality may not be a major consideration, but it could, there could be uh, demonstrable benefits to air quality. And I think that's uh, a really positive aspect of CAPS, is trying to identify co- and multiple benefits. 
Indeed, I mean, another area where there's a sort of conflict of interest within the government, and, and an understandable one, is the need to build new houses, which we all aspire to, and the figure used to be 35,000 a year that's required uh, in Scotland, and I'm no longer certain what that is. But um, I know we're not delivering on our housing targets, but if we were able to deliver on the housing targets, then, and those are largely going to be not even in our towns, but largely in our <coughs> city areas where the air pollution is already high. So you have uh, one part of government seeking to improve air quality, but another part of government seeking to build uh, more houses in our city areas, which will add to the problem. Uh, of course, offset against that is the potential for electric cars uh, coming and much more into use. Uh, is that going to be sufficient to offset that um, rise in air pollution around city areas with house building? I think there's a couple of elements that come to mind immediately. Uh, the first is to make sure that the, the charging infrastructure is in place. So when new developments are being designed, not when they're being built, when they're being designed at the front end, the charging infrastructure is in place for every single property. And because we are looking at a, a game-changing approach to how we, we move around our, our spaces. So uh, I'm, I'd like to see new developments having that as a, as a, as a absolute rather than as a, an add-on or as a nice-to-have. So that's the first part. The second part, I know from speaking to the bus sector, have, have uh, wanting to be involved in, in dialogue and around the, the transport design of, of, of developments from the outset so that there is a, there's an economical reason for a bus route to move through that uh, development rather than taking a loop and essentially doubling back on themselves. So that, that's just one example that springs to mind about uh, bus operators rightly wanting to make a profit and have a, having a, an, an economical route, but perhaps new developments being designed in a way that are causing unintentionally a loop back on a bus operator to essentially double their journey. So there's some, there's some relatively easy wins in there uh, that can be done uh, at the front end of design. I think you're right insofar as certainly if the planners have got lots of different priorities chucked at them and they've got to try and make it all work. Um, and that's not always easy, and that, that, that's, but that's part of the job. I think for, for me, um, if you want to try and increase the, the housing stock, well, at the same time not impact on, uh, on air quality, key is getting houses in the right location um, so they've got the right connections so they minimise car use. <coughs> they don't add to it in the first place as well. I think we can also look at a range of different things, like the scale of developments, uh, the range of uses within that development as well, so you don't have to travel to get to different things. Um, the density, the design uh, can have an impact on things as well. The materials which we use, <coughs> as we've talked on already as well. The siting, the spaces between buildings and how they can be used to try and soak up, if that's the right term, some of the air quality issues which you have. So so there are there are lots of different priorities which planners face. Housing is the one that's getting thrown in our face just now, to be honest with you. We're trying our best to do that. But their job is to try and come up with some form of solution which makes sure that what we do build is something which sustain it's just sustainable and which actually has positive impacts rather than negative impacts. Yes, and finally, I mean another conflict is the the one that Graham Day has already uh, touched on is the, the development of biomass plants, the development of wood burning, wood burning stoves in urban areas, which again is not reducing um, uh, or improving air quality, but rather reducing it. Um, and th that's another <laughs> part of government that's trying to achieve one thing and, and, a, and a different part of, um, although per perhaps in the same office in government, but not notwithstanding people with two different objectives and they're both conflicting. And I think, would, that, would you suggest that these sort of conflicts where they occur should be more thought through? It used to be called joined up thinking, but it's never an expression that I liked in the past. But, um, but it nonetheless has a point. Should there be more of that? I've uh, raised on several occasions with, with Scottish government officials and ministers the fact, if you look at the programme for government, there are about 14 bills in it. Um, and for things like air quality and for planning, you'll have bills which will affect it. So we've got a planning bill coming up, we've got a transport bill, we've got a, a climate change bill, it's an islands bill. I think there's a need to try and make sure that all these bills, uh, when they become acts, um, are thought through. And there is some conversation to make sure they don't contradict one another, that they complement one another and support one another as well. Um, I have been told that happens. Uh, I hope for that will be the case when we, we see the bills go through uh, parliamentary sessions uh, as, it, as it comes up. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Emma Harper, did you wish to come in on something? Yeah, it was similar to um, what uh, John Scott um, talked about. I was reading about research related to air quality and people in Scotland don't realise that air quality does impact their health. We've got like one person every five minutes dying of a lung condition. So I'm just curious about research that would be conducted into promoting knowledge around lung health and who would conduct research and who would you know, fund it, obviously. I think British Heart Foundation spent 6.9 million for medical research in 2015 and came up with some interesting data. I don't think the research itself is the issue. I think we've we'll, we'll probably got the evidence there. It's the communicating and articulation of that research and we perhaps have to get better at that. I think there's a, um, a big part of all this is behaviour change. And what we've been talking about it is almost like the, the private sector and the public sector changing their behaviour. But there's, a, there's a, a, a responsibility on individuals and people like ourselves to think about how we change our behaviour. Do we need to jump into our car to go to the shops? Should we be going? Should we actually go and walk in there as well? So there's something that might be trying to push that to individuals that they have some responsibility in taking this forward as much as waiting for government or someone else to do it for them. Yeah, I would agree with that. The, the data is strong. And in terms of the published research already, that uh, as individual studies are grouped together in terms of cumulative effect, that understand is that Health Protection Scotland are aware of that research, and that's what is, is used to provide advice to, to ministers. So the, the evidence is there. Uh, as, as Craig says, it's, it's about communicating that in a, a sensible, non-technical language to, to everyone in Scotland so that they make the right choices, particularly how, how they... They, they, they travel and move uh, between their, their homes and work or, or wherever they have to go. So it's about communicating that in a simple, non-technical language. And I guess the one that springs to mind immediately is what is it about attributable deaths? It's a very technical, uh, medical-based uh, language. So how do you distill that down into something that makes sense to the layperson? Finally, I think, uh, Mark Roscoe. Thanks, convener. I think just as we draw the session to a close, I'm just trying to get clear something in my own mind. Uh, I mean, Graham Applegate, you'd said earlier on in the session that you're, you're very confident that we'll meet legal compliance by 2020. I think Stephen Thompson, you'd said that you're very confident the government will meet its uh, walking and cycling targets, the 10% by 2020. But at the same time, throughout the session this morning, you've said we need to take a longer view, we need to manage expectations, it's all about medium to long-term action and cultural change. Uh, is there not a, a, I mean, how do you square those two? I mean, are we going to meet targets or not? Or, or actually is now the time for you to manage expectations? First, um, I think I, I was specifically talking about the EU legal targets. The domestic targets are probably the longer-term aspiration. Um, and because the two systems run together but are different, then we have to make that separation. So um, looking at the, the EU aspect first, I, 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 I do think that we will be compliant in those three areas and the likelihood is Glasgow may also be compliant by 2020. The AQMA aspect from the domestic legislation will be a longer term approach because it's far more localised air quality problems and the, the aspiration of CAFs is to remove all of these air quality management areas over time. We have a, a further issue um, arising in that with the adoption of the PM 2.5 objective for 2020, that's likely to create more air quality management areas because it will find more problems. So that, that will always be a, a movable, movable feast and uh, all of the work of CAFs or in local air quality management should ultimately arrive in all of those air quality management areas being removed. So I, I just think the distinction between the two uh, regulatory regimes needs to be clarified, but um, I'm, I'm definitely hopeful that the, the EU compliance will be achieved. In terms of nitrous oxide, the NOx, you believe, will be compliant? The NO2, I, I think we will be compliant, and if we aren't compliant, it won't be very far after 2020 when compliance is achieved. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think my mind goes back to the, again, the, the medical evidence that there is no safe limit for particulate matter. So even if we're achieving the targets in the short term, those targets could well be tightened and tightened and tightened again so that the actions that we're looking at in the medium to long term should be going, have half an eye on where we, we, 
the equality needs to be in terms of the, the links to there being no safe level on, on a particular matter. The, the short-term actions, I, I guess is the word has been used several times today about the cumulative effect. So it's moving all of those shorter-term actions to support achievement of the, the, the medium and longer-term aspirations. But in terms of your, your point about walking and cycling, I mean, we're at 2% of journeys cycled at the moment. You think we're going to get to 10% by 2020? That, that's what my colleagues in, in Transport Scotland have, okay. have... I haven't read anything other than that that says that that's the journey, pardon the pun, that that's, that's what they're on. I'm in there with my hat on as the chair of the National Walking Strategy Implementation Forum. Um, I think we're seeing walking is an, up an upward trajectory. Um, and, and I think with the plan, the, the strategy now in place and a delivery plan now in place, we're starting to, see, we're starting to get some, some benefits from that as well. I think the increase in the active travel budget will hopefully go some way to trying to do that as well. And if we can build upon that, I'm hopeful we will meet those targets. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I thank all three of you for the evidence given this morning? I think it's been very, very helpful to the committee in its consideration. And can I also uh, remind you to submit any written follow-up evidence that you've undertaken to submit uh, uh, as soon as it's convenient, because I think there's some things that we need to have a look at. So, again, thank you for that. Uh, at its next meeting on the 7th of November, the committee will continue to take evidence as part of this inquiry into air quality in Scotland. And as agreed earlier, we'll now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is now closed. Thank you. <laughs>